All right, let's pray and we'll get going for today. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we come before you again, God, asking your help in a time of need. The time of need is a constant state of affairs down here. As we look in, as we look out at a wicked and perverse generation that is set in concrete not to serve you, not to do your will, not to obey you, and to just stoically sit, sit there against God, refusing to do the will of God and uh, obey the dictates of the living God. And God, we're in the midst of these trying times as a light in the midst of darkness and and as a witness to Jesus Christ and your righteousness. So God, therefore, we ask you now to endow us with power from on high to actually do the works of an evangelist and save as many of these people as possible. Knowing that Everyone won't be saved, but we're here to be a witness to those that will. So God, let us have eyes to see, ears to hear, have direction given that we can zero in on that which you have called to be and not waste time on that which is unfruitful. God, we don't want to burn energy on that which is going nowhere. But let us have a direct contact with the mind of Christ that we can do the will of God and do nothing more or nothing less. So God, right now we pray for guidance. We pray for the wisdom of God, the leading of the Holy Spirit, and the mind of Christ to synchronize in us that everything we do will bring forth fruit after his own kind. God, will give you the praise and honor and glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Alright, we'll start today in Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 31. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 31. Jeremiah 2 31. And it reads, O generation, see ye the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness unto Israel, a land of darkness? Wherefore say my people, We are lords. We will come no more unto thee. So the people are saying, I don't need a lord because I'm a lord. I'm a god. I don't need to answer to a god because I am my own god. Can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. They've forgotten me. Derek Prince used to say one of the greatest sins you'll ever commit is to treat God as if he does not exist. To ignore him as if he's inconsequential. He's gum on the bottom of your shoe, basically. Why trimmest thou thy way to seek love? Therefore hast thou also taught the wicked ones thy ways. Now you've got the people of God teaching wicked people the ways of the people that claim to be God's people, they're wicked, and they're teaching wicked people how to be more wicked. Now that's pitiful. They set up institutions and organizations to actually accommodate wicked people while claiming to serve God. Also, when thy skirts is found, the blood of the souls of the poor innocents. I have not found it by secret search, but upon all these. Yet thou sayest, because I am innocent, surely his anger shall turn from me. Behold, I will plead with thee, because thou sayest, I have not sinned. Why gaddest thou about so much to change thy way? Thou also shalt be ashamed of Egypt, as thou was ashamed of Assyria. Yea, thou shalt go forth from him, and thine hands upon thine head. For the Lord hath rejected thy confidences, and thou shalt not prosper in them. So I'm a Lord, I'm a God. God has rejected my proud confidence, and nothing will prosper that's being done. All of this is cause and effect as we zero in on one particular verse here, verse 34. Also in thy skirts is found the blood of the souls of the poor innocents. I have not found it by secret search, but upon all these. So we're going to talk today about the topic, the slaughterhouse. The slaughterhouse. We are living in a slaughterhouse. We wake up every morning, go to work, 
drive home, go to the store and and we buy dinner, come home and cook it, wash clothes, iron the clothes. We go through the daily routines of life, going to school, studying at school, catching the school bus, making sure your lunch is prepared the next day for school, you know, doing all these things, taking baths, uh, repairing cars, fueling cars. I mean, just the daily routines of life. Not understanding we drive to work and commute on streets that are bathed in blood. Blood flowing like a river. Because on every corner you got a slaughterhouse. They're butchering these young babies everywhere. And everybody remains quiet. And we go on as if it's business as usual. How can a man stand in a pulpit like Joel Osteen and tell you you can have your best life now? Tell you that every day is Friday. Tell you to prophesy over yourself your own destiny until it comes to pass. And the streets are bathed in blood knee deep with the souls of what God calls the young innocents. He says that this blood is in the skirts of the women. So God sees pools of blood just draped over folk and dripping down the legs of folks as they walk around. Their very bodies have become nothing but slaughterhouses. Killed one baby, two babies, five babies aborted in a slaughterhouse. I was talking to a guy the other day, a truck driver. I asked him, I said, man, I hadn't seen you around for a while. This was on a Monday. He said, yeah, Friday, I had to take my girl to get an abortion. We, I got two babies by her, not married to her. And she got pregnant the third time, but I didn't want another baby, so I took her to get an abortion. He was, like he was talking about buying a loaf of bread. I'm looking at him. Murderer. Murder first degree. Right in front of you. Casual conversation. Means less than nothing to him. How do we have a whole nation, a whole world walking around with all these people murdered and nobody says a word? How can you preach a prosperity message? That's why you know it's not germane to what we're in. With wholesale murder committed on a daily basis, Monday through Saturday, all day long. Those vacuum extraction hoses are hooked up, ripping babies limb from limb. Saline solution poured into wounds and burning the baby alive in the womb. And we go around. The biggest deal to most folks was that Georgia lost to South Carolina yesterday. The Falcons, will they maintain their undefeated season? The Braves were knocked out of the playoffs. That's what's on the minds of people. Locked into all these things going, going on. Folks are in jerseys right now. Right now as I'm speaking, they're out there tailgating. Waiting for the Steelers to play. Or the Vikings to play. And the streets are bathed in blood. Hundreds of babies slaughtered yesterday, Friday, Thursday, all through the week. Ignored. Nobody says a word. Nobody says a word. It's, it's cause and effect. There's a reason for this too. I'm, we're going to zero down and, and, and grind down on the reasons for all of this. Butchering babies one after another. Babies ripped limb from limb. Burned alive every, every day. How do you know you're alive? You got a pulse. That baby in that womb has a pulse. It's a living entity. The laws allow for the baby being a person. If I go outside right now and find a pregnant woman and blow her brains out, they're going to charge me with homicide and feticide or infanticide. Double murder. How can you charge me with a double murder if I kill a pregnant woman, yet the doctor that's butchering the baby is innocent? This is the insanity of a whole nation, a whole culture, a whole world. Your own laws define the fact that the baby is a person because you charge a person with infanticide or feticide. Now, if it's not a person, 
Why do you have this law on the book? You know why? They do it like that because they don't want the woman to feel the guilt of murdering her own child. A man to feel the guilt of you murdered your own child. You actually murdered your own offspring. Butchered them. And you and, and, the, and the most telltale sign is, and you feel nothing about it. You hacked your own baby to death. And you feel nothing about it. You burn your baby alive with saline solution. And you feel nothing about it. How is this possible? How can a human race get so detached from life? So detached from reality? What the Bible calls inordinate affections. You don't even feel like a human being anymore. Kill with no conscience. No regrets. No shame. Murder in the first degree, and God says, the blood of the young innocents, the blood of the souls of the poor, innocent ones are in your skirts. Said I didn't I didn't find it by a secret search. He says you openly declare it. They'll tell you they had an abortion with no shame. Murder. In the first degree. See, anybody that's been involved in an abortion, like me, killing a baby, my own baby at 19 years old, a girl I got pregnant. I have the moral authority to talk about this. See, I'm not talking down to anybody. I had to go to God and confess the fact that I was a cold-blooded murderer. And I'm asking for forgiveness, throwing myself on the courts. The court's mercy. I sinned against you and I killed a human. But see how many people don't want to do that? They don't want to come face to face with the fact that I am a murderer. A killer. Point the finger at Charles Manson. Wayne Gacy. Mob killers. But what about yourself? The book stops there. Murder. And what person could murder their own child? A helpless victim. A victim with no ability to defend themselves. A victim with no ability to draw a gun on you, pull a knife on you, even to to fend off what you're doing. Helpless, innocent victim having done nothing to anybody. Butchered like an animal. No more sweeping all this sin under a rug and letting the public and the culture get a free pass while some skinning, grinning boob tells you your best life is now and every day is Friday. How can every day, if every day is a Friday, every Friday the abortuary opens to burn and murder and slash the throats of thousands of young innocent children. And every day is Friday. That means every day is a day for murder. Life is not pretty. Life is not sweet. Life is not cute. Folks need to be brought eye to eye with themselves to understand what they've really become. Animals, butcherers, manimals. You look at Hitler, Auschwitz, Bougainville, Treblinka, death camps where he killed six million Jews. And America has killed ten times that many folk. Sixty million babies almost. And you want to call Hitler a monster. We make Hitler look like, he looks like a saint compared to us. He killed six million adults who might have had the ability to defend themselves. We butcher 60 million young innocent babies that have no ability to defend themselves. Why do the babies pay the price? Because folks want to fornicate. They want to have illicit sex. They want to go out there and live like animals and then kill the child that came forth as the result of it. 
So that's why the trash in the White House, I ignore that trash. You stand there and Obama says, I have a hard time even calling him a president now. Say respect the office and all that. This is garbage. He says if a young teenager makes the mistake of getting pregnant, why would we want to punish her with a baby? That's insanity. You just told me you have an insane mind. That's a human being. What are you talking about? She lay, she was big enough to lay down and make the baby. Well, bless God, be big enough to have the baby and care for the baby. Why should we want to punish them with a baby? Conscience is seared with a hot iron. No natural affection. Dead men walking with no care for anybody. So what the world hates is the truth of God's word that looks you right in the eye and tells you about yourself. They hate that. I don't want to be confronted with who and what I am and what I've become. I want to escape to the football game today. I want to think about the lottery. I want to see another movie, entertainment, another show. I don't want you confronting me with me. Scan the TV on Sunday morning, one boo preacher after another. Preaching a bunch of nothingness with auditoriums packed to the rafters with people escaping reality. It's garbage. It's trash. It's time to stop. Bring this thing back to a full halt and preach the truth of the matter. Stop escaping from what's real. Stop praying to God as if everything's all right. Because God knows it's not all right. The problem with Jeremiah in his day was he would not pretend about anything. Jeremiah would not play about anything. Jeremiah was set in his ways and in his mind to, to do what he had to do and not be, not be confused and not be halted and stopped by folks that didn't like him. They wanted to believe that the Babylonians were not coming. That God is with us and we will, we will be alright. Jeremiah said, I tell you what, the Babylonians are coming. They're going to burn this place to the ground. He didn't say go out and fight them. He said surrender to them. This is the will of God. Don't try to fight them because your own sins have done what? They found you out. Your idolatry has brought God's judgment and you cannot escape it. We live in a slaughterhouse. You ever seen a slaughterhouse where they kill beef and pigs? Chickens? Man, blood flows out of a slaughterhouse like a river. You got stinking, animals stink when you slaughter them. I mean, gut a pig. That's a stinking mess. And blood just everywhere. Throats slashed. Animals gutted. A slaughterhouse. And we live in one. We walk around in it. We take a bath in it. You go to work in it. You talk to murderers every day. You yourself may have had an apple out of that bag as a murderer. How can a Christian that's a murderer, forgiven by God's grace, be proud? What are we proud about? Why are we looking down on other folks? It's by grace that we stand. God's mercy has allowed us to be a Christian. We don't come with attitudes of con- of condescending uh, uh, arrogance trying to Put on people that which they can't take. Because I'm talking across to people, not down to them. But you have to come face to face with your sin to be forgiven. 
a murderer. Murder in the first degree. That's why he says, there's none righteous, no, not one. All of your righteousness is like a filthy rag. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us going our own separate ways. We have all sinned and fallen short of his glory. That's the way it is. The difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is a Christian came to terms with what I really am. And I'm not going to put this mask on at Halloween anymore and pretend I'm somebody else. See, that's why the world likes to be entertained by make-believe caricatures of people. Nicki Minaj. See that you see how they never have their own names and they take on a character, Lady Gaga, Madonna, Jay Z. They have to assume a make believe characterization of a person because folk don't want to deal with reality. I like that which is make believe and fantasy stricken. Because if things are real, if you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You make me have to deal with myself. People aren't running from King Kong or Godzilla or the Predator or any of these other make-believe creatures. They are running from themselves. And guess what? The only person you take with you when you're running from yourself is you. That's why you can run But you can't hide. And all the Bible does when it's preached in righteousness, it it finds you out. It searches you out. And turns the spotlight on what you are. See, that's why God is is so perfect. You can't hide what you are from God. It will be revealed. A slaughterhouse. A stinking, filthy slaughterhouse. We'll walk out of here today in pools of blood. You'll drive down the street in pools of blood. You'll walk into your house in pools of blood. You'll sleep tonight in pools of blood. You'll wake up tomorrow morning and you step foot on your floor beside your bed. You'll step down into a pool of blood. You'll bathe in a pool of blood, not water, blood. Because these babies' bloods have flooded the whole environment. It's a bloodbath in the streets. The souls of the young innocents. In another place the Bible says they cry out to God. Remember when Cain slew Abel? The Bible says his blood is crying out from the ground. If one man was killed and his blood cried out from the ground. Imagine 50 to 60 million people killed. And the cry that goes up to heaven day and night for vengeance. These babies are saying before God, we need some type of restitution and retribution paid for what we went through. We were slaughtered before we even took a breath. Yet God stays his hand. He has every right to wipe this place out because of the murders committed here. And don't try to change any language from here on out. Stop trying to conform your language to, to fit into the culture. Murder in the first degree. Everybody that stands in the political arena that's for abortion is pro-murder. They try to change it to pro-life versus pro-choice. Well, hold it. If I'm pitted against you and I'm pro-life, the opposite of life is not choice. You see what I'm saying? You see how they change it? If I'm pro-life, how do you switch it to pro-choice on your side? No, it's got to be pro-life or pro-death. That's why I hate this stinking, filthy hellhole. They don't want you to speak in plain terms. And this is why the apostles say if we use plainness of speech. I don't vary from anything. One thing you have to admire about Paul. 
is that Paul didn't change. Paul was fully persuaded. What they hated about him, he wouldn't vary. Peter, I was stood him to his face because he was to be blamed. John Mark failed me one time, went back on us, wouldn't go. Next time they want to take John Mark, he can't go. He's a wet noodle that failed me in the time of battle. I'm going to face demons, hell on earth, Satan, and he's a wet noodle that's failed the test. Leave the boy here, he can't go. And the Bible says, Paul and Barnabas separated over John Mark. You know what happened? You know what he told Barnabas? Forget you too. See, most folk ain't ready for a military affair that we're going into. This is going to be a military affair. This soft soul stuff, folk walking in thinking they're saved, they're going to fall away by the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, because they're not ready for a military conflict. This old weak need mess they've been taught in church, when this thing really comes to the forefront front, and you find out that these folks that are murdering these babies will kill you too. That's when most folks turn back and turn into a wet noodle like John Mark. And guess what? God is not going back to get you. Leave them alone. See, it's going to get raw. I'm looking forward to it because it will separate the wheat from the chaff. The tares will have to go away and be bundled to be burned. To stop plaguing the real body of Christ. Most folk kid themselves about this. So we're going to microscopically examine two sections of scripture to get a real view of this stinking, filthy slaughterhouse. And what's about to happen here is we tell you some prophetic things that are coming online right now. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Living in the confines of a stinking, filthy, bloody slaughterhouse. Now you need to be more positive. I am. I'm positively sure that this is a slaughterhouse. See, positivity is not germane to the gospel. The gospel is not a positive message. The Bible is a message of reality. Whether it be positive or negative. God doesn't promise us anything as far as comfort and not suffering. You can't find that promise in the Bible. Everything done in the Christian life is done in spite of what you go through. Maisha battling cancer. God expects her to press on. You're not going to downgrade it. I don't care what she got. You got to keep pressing on. The Bible, if you read it very carefully and microscopically, microscopically, is not concerned about you living down here. That's not the goal of this Bible. You see how many folks God sent into their death knowing they were going to die after what they did? John the Baptist confronted Herod. God didn't stop him. He was full of the Holy Ghost. He could put the brakes on John the Baptist. He didn't. He didn't put the, the brakes on Stephen. Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost. He could put the brakes on Stephen. He didn't. Because he wasn't interested in them living down here. Messages that keep teaching you to try to have a best life down, down here now and trying to live down here comfortably and promising you, you you can't suffer. They're all birthed in hell. That trash Fred Price preached for years was birthed in hell. Creflo Dollar is a messenger from the pit of hell. Joel Osteen was sent by hell. T.D. Jakes came from the bowels of hell. They are all Apollyons, destroying angels, sent by the chief of the Apollyons, Satan himself, who is a destroying angel. Because they are not preparing you for eternal life. I said it, make it clear when you quote it. We better stop fooling around with this make-believe garbage because you can't afford to be damned 
trying to stay on in the middle ground and stay in a gray area yourself. He says if you don't represent him before men, he won't represent you before his father. It's terrifying to try to stay in a gray area. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, look at this microscopic analysis of it. Verse 1, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. He said, I don't care if if a spirit tells you, if somebody tells it to you, or somebody writes a letter and tells you it came from us. Don't be troubled by any of that. that, that so telling you the day of Christ is in hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. Look what he says. For that particular day shall not come. Except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So, the day of Christ won't come until there's a falling away. The word there in the Greek for falling away is the Greek word apostasia. We get the English word apostasy from it. What does apostasy mean? It means a defection from revealed truth. Now, you know, in military terms, a defector is a person who is on your side in battle, in a war. But in the middle of the battle, what do they do? They turn coat. They change sides. So the apostasy is actually what? People who change sides. They were with you. And turned against you. When you see that begin to happen. A changing of sides. Those who were once pretending to walk with you. Turn against you. That's the telltale sign. That the apostasy. And that spirit. Is flowing through the arena. And it's happening. Right now. An apostasy takes place. Now here's going to be, here's the stimuli for the apostasy. This nation has opened up its doors to immigration from around the world. As a result, you have invaders from the east flowing in like a tidal wave. You can't bring in folks from foreign lands and expect them to come in here and undergird this culture. They bring their culture with them. They bring their beliefs with them. And the most important thing they bring with them is what? Their gods. You see in the presidential race, Mitt Romney, who is a Mormon, Obama is an abomination so you have nothing there that you can put any credence into as far as a vote as far as a Christian is concerned well how can you say Obama is an abomination he says he's a Christian because no Christian stands in front of the UN and tells you that a Muslim that a Muslim leader is, is the prophet and we should honor other religions a Christian can't say that See, it's not a choice of whether or not you did say it or what you, you, you should say it or if the president, I'm a leader of everybody. A Christian, I don't care what office you hold, can't say that. You're forbidden to give any credence to any other gods. So therefore, that totally eliminates your Christianity. Folks don't like this. We're not called to preach what what tickles ears. We're called to preach the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ as a deliverer from this place. Now, 
All these different cultures come in here, all these different belief systems, all these different gods, and what do you get? You get a society that's in turmoil like it is now. You don't see the, ter- the, the, the turmoil in society if they come with false religions and false gods and now they try to push what on you? Diversity. Tolerance. Incorporation of all beliefs. You have to be politically correct. You can't tell the truth. See, all that is another way of saying, don't stand on absolutes. Don't stand on principle. Don't stand on what is true from the Bible's perspective. You need to be politically correct to to actually allow people to infiltrate the environment and not feel put out by you. They used to call it, you have to have tact. That's not the Bible. We proclaim. We issue ultimatums. We don't have tact. We don't accommodate anybody but Jesus Christ alone. There is no other name given amongst men whereby ye must be saved. Period. A pseudo-Christian will try to accommodate everybody. They bring this stuff in here. What's going to get leverage? I can guarantee you this Islam will. The only religion that fits the bill for cutting your head off in Revelation is Islam. They decapitate folk that are infidels. That's why they got a seedbed in the White House to propagate their tactics from. You better know this about a a person that's really a Muslim. They're authorized to lie to the infidels with, buddy. Have to tell the infidels the truth. You can assume any role. What's the purpose? Worldwide domination and Sharia law. You see, when you see a nation in the Middle East, you don't see a, a nation just named Egypt or Jordan or what, an Islamic Republic. And this Islamic Republic, the word, word Republic means law. They govern themselves according to Islamic law. See, Americans are sitting up in the middle of this, and you don't know, you're sitting up in the middle of a slaughterhouse. Not being prepared for what's about to happen, sitting up in pseudo-churches, make-believe religious arenas, hearing soft messages. The Bible says they tickle you. They, They scratch your itching ears. When Jeremiah, Isaiah... The heavy hitting prophets were prophesying. You know what the people told them? Prophesy unto us. Smooth things, man. Don't tell us this stuff that makes me feel bad. Makes me have to deal with the volatility I live in. And the war that's about to happen. I'm not going to do that. You have to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. So you see here, there must come an apostasy first, a falling away from revealed truth. For the day of Christ to be revealed. He says, a man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition. That word for man there is the Greek word anthropos. We get the word anthropology from it. What is anthropology? The study of man and his culture. An anthropos of sin. So that's a man of sin. A human being of sin. That eliminates anybody believing that the Antichrist is just a spirit. That's what I try to get across to G. Craig Lewis. The Antichrist is not just a spirit man. The Antichrist is going to be standing in front of you with a machete to take your head off. That ain't a spirit. You got to understand this about the word Antichrist and the system of Antichrist. The Antichrist is a man. The Antichrist is a spirit. And the Antichrist is a system. 
So man is a spirit that gets in a man to govern a system. If you don't, if you don't know the, the whole panoramic, panoramic view of the Bible, if you don't have the proper, what they call exegesis, which means to draw out from the Bible the truth of it, if you don't have the right ability to draw out what it's saying, you'll come to your own conclusion about it and, and, and proclaim that it's real. The panoramic view tells you that the Bible paints a picture of a man, a spirit, and a system. Babylon is the system. The man is the Antichrist. And he tells you in 1 John chapter 5 that this is the spirit of Antichrist that has already gone forth in the world. So you see that it's all a broad panoramic view of a spirit, a man who governs a system. You got to see it like that to get the full revelation of it. Don't drill down on one part of it. I believe the Antichrist is the Pope. Well, I believe the Antichrist is the system. Well, I believe the Antichrist is the spirit. Well, I see the Antichrist as a man. No, buddy. It's all of that and more. See the big picture when you read the Bible. Don't get lost looking at trees when, you, when you've got a forest in front of you. So he says the man of sin, the anthropos of sin, he'll be revealed. The son of perdition. That word perdition, the Greek word apollia. It formats the word in Revelation apollion or abaddon. The destroying angel from the bottomless pit. This is the man of destruction. He's the son of destruction. He's destroying the old culture. The old way of doing business. He'll change laws and rules. He's going to change the entire culture and fabric of the entire world. Just like Hitler did. Hitler is a precursor and a type of an antichrist. You see how he got in everybody's mind? Faithfulness to Hitler was always uh, evaluated based on you raising your right hand and saying what? Hail Hitler. The right hand is your hand of what? Authority and oath. When you go to court, put your left hand on a Bible, raise your right hand. I swear on this Bible. Notice what book they put out there to swear on. This place is a, is a place of hypocrisy. The oath. Raising the hand of the legions and saying, Hail Caesar. Hail Hitler. That's what it's all about. The mark of the beast is actually allegiance to the beast. Allegiance to that spirit Allegiance to that man, allegiance to that system. So I don't like you if you don't vote. Because you're not showing allegiance to the system. You stand and pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the republic, the rules of law for which the flag stands. But what about the laws? Abortion is legal. I pledge allegiance to abortion as I pledge allegiance to the rule of law in this nation. I don't align myself with allegiance to abortion. That's why you are a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, called out from amongst them to show forth the praises of him that has delivered you from all of this. We're not of this world. But a lot of folks don't want to wear the banner of Jesus Christ and align themselves with him to show forth the fact that I've come out from amongst them. I'm not of this world anymore. You got to get used to eating your lunch by yourself. Being the ostracized one, the weird one. What's in you that makes you want to fit in still? I want them to like me. I don't care if anybody likes me. 
I'm not here to be liked. I'm here to get a job done. We're in the expeditionary force to deliver a message in a, in a sin blighted, darkened world run by a fallen cherubim angel that is totally evil and reprobate. And you want to be liked by him and his folks. What's wrong with the Christian that the, the, the intestinal fortitude is not in place? Just to be a representative and ambassador for Christ and I don't need to be liked by anybody. They'll try to tell you that every human being has a need and an inclination to be loved and liked by others. That's normal to the human being and how you're made. No, it ain't. Something's, something's wrong with you if you need to be liked, if you need to be loved, if you need to be needed, if you need to be seen, if you need to be heard, if you need to be whatever. Is something wrong with you? Get the uplink and the vertical look into God's face. Get commands and deliver messages. Do what you're told to do. Oblivious to who likes you. He told Jeremiah, if you look at them when, I, when you go tell them what I told you to tell them, if you look at their faces and try to evaluate their countenances and see if they like you or not, I'll confound you right in front of them and you'll lose your track of thought and you won't even remember what you're supposed to say. You're oblivious to the responses to you. You proclaim the truth. Period. You watch on Facebook. You get one person telling the truth. Other folks are, oh, just preach. Oh, you know how to tell it. That's a person that's not in. Always trying to support you and give you accolades. Trying to lift you up and say that you're really on point. Or you really are dynamic. Or you, well, what are you? Why don't you speak up? You're gutless and you're spineless trying to stand behind somebody else. And guess what? Because you denied me before men, I will deny you before my Father which is in heaven. You don't make it in without personal representation of Christ here. You're not going to make it in. How can I go and smooth along beside Elijah? John the Baptist, Moses. Look at the heavy prices these guys paid. Samuel and David and all these folk. Frontline fighters. Paul, Stephen, James, John, Peter. Heavy hitters. Marriage supper of the Lamb for those who have come out of a military assignment as soldiers who stood up in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation and did not faint from the task. And I think I'm going in too. What resume allows me in here? Look at these guys' resumes. What makes me believe I'm going to heaven? Working a nine to five every day. And sleeping in on Saturday in a pool of blood. Just imagine what they would have said about this mess down here. And we're sitting here now, everybody's strangely quiet. And I'm going to show you why people are strangely quiet in just a minute. He says, this man of sin, after the fall away, this man of sin will be revealed the son of destruction and damnation. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. The word anti in the Greek has two meanings. One, to stand against. The secondary meaning, to stand in place of. So he says here he opposes and then exalts himself above all that is called God. Or that is worshipped so that he as God. He as God. He as God. Sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. What did Jesus Christ call this right here, verse 4? What did he call it? The abomination of desolation. Better interpret it, the abomination of desecration. He desecrates the temple. He desecrates the individual temple of a human if the spirit of Antichrist is worshipped in you. He desecrates the Jewish temple in Israel if he sits in there as God. 
He desecrates a society if the society is governed by the Antichrist. He's a desecrator that leads to desolation. Everywhere the devil's spirit goes, he makes it nasty, filthy, dirty. He's a desecrator and he's a desolator. So he says he's, he sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now God has already told us in his word, know you not, that you are the temple of God. We are a temple. We're a house of worship. So the Antichrist spirit is vying for enthronement in your heart so that you worship that spirit. And by that definition, you can see the spirit of Antichrist has everybody on this planet just about taken over. They worship the president. They worship some silly preacher. They worship a singer. They worship athletes. They worship all these folks. Chipper Jones retires from the Braves. All these accolades, all these big gatherings and all these gifts given to him as he travels throughout the major leagues. And I'm not blaming Chipper Jones for anything. I'm telling you how people are. They worship Chipper Jones. They put Chipper Jones on a pedestal. Chipper Jones blows the game Friday night. That lets you know what man will do for you. They blow up everything. And it always unravels. I hate the feeling of sitting somewhere rooting for another guy and he fails. And your emotions are attached to his failure. He throws an interception and your emotions are attached to him failing. You know what that is? It's worship. You are depending on a human being to fulfill something in you and they let you down. Because your affections are where? On the earth and not above. Georgia goes to South Carolina and gets slaughtered yesterday. Folks walking around depressed this morning. Ready to kill Mark Rick. All that is is God telling Mark Ritt to leave this foolishness alone, get full of the Holy Ghost and get on with the gospel. The days of college football and this trash is over. You're wasting time, Mark Ritt, if you're a son of God. Data dump that trash and get on with the gospel, man. That's why it leads to failure of a guy. God won't let him succeed. You know how frustrated it is when God has got his hand on you and you're trying to do something else that he don't want you to do. Man, that's the most frustrating thing in life. Atlanta has been marked as being loserville for a reason. God won't let sports get exalted in this city because he's got it paid for something else. This is going to be a breakout city, I believe. Well, the gospel is going to explode on the scene. He's not going to let this city get caught up in the hoopla of being some kind of a mega sports center. It's almost like the city is cursed and can't make it. And I say, Amen. Look, we've got to project the gospel. We've got to get our minds narrowed down to be messengers of hope, people that deliver folk. People that set folks free. People are bound by all kinds of diabolical devils. Incapacitated. Mentally, spiritually, and physically incapacitated. And the only liberators that are bound down here are us. The church of Jesus Christ. So he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholds that he might be revealed in his time. So now he says, now you know what's holding him back. What did he, what did he tell us what's holding him back? The apostasy. the apostasy. He can't be revealed until there's an apostasy. The, 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 the cholesterol that holds the floor of the Antichrist back 
is the fact that church folk still operate in a Judeo-Christian ethic. See, as long as you get the people to uphold a Judeo-Christian ethic that undergirds their morality and what they'll stand for, the Antichrist can't come. Go back into the 1950s. TV shows were Ozzy and Harriet, Leave it to Beaver, I Love Lucy, I love Lucy. Father Knows Best. That's a curse show today. Father Knows Best? Are you crazy? Andy Griffith, The Dick Van Dyke Show, a little later on, The Mary Tyler Moore Show. Basically, generically harmless shows. Now, perversion, homosexuality, lesbianism, filth, gutter rot, stinking trash that would make a dog vomit is entertainment. Why did that happen? Because the spirit of Antichrist is diluting the Judeo-Christian ethic that would stand against it. There is no uproar against the filth. To become successful, all you have to be is a whore and go make a porno tape and get internet exposure. And then this thing, you know, you got a reality show. That's the curse of the culture propagated by the Antichrist spirit. He's diluted the Judeo-Christian ethic. Christianity came from the loins of Judaism. So it's a Judeo based on the Pentateuch, the five books of the Bible, the first five books of the Bible, the law of Moses. that spilled over into the Old Testament that flowed into the New. The ethics and the values of those two systems, the Judeo-Christian ethics, is what upholds a nation. He has to dilute that. He has to dilute morality based on the rulership of God, the commandments of God, the mind of God, the spirit of God. He dilutes it all. He dilutes it. Your president says that if homosexuality is wrong, then we can't even wear a garment made of two kinds of thread. According to the Old Testament. You can't sow your field with two different kinds of seed. He's trying to tell you that the archaic laws of the Old Testament are not germane to the New Testament. Because God said don't sow your field with two different kinds of seed. Don't use two kinds of different uh, uh, threads or, or materials in your garment. No mixture allowed. You have to, he says you got to go out and stone your wife for adultery. How can you transfer all that Old Testament stuff to the new? He says that's the sign and lets you know that anything said about homosexuality in the Old Testament can't be translated and brought over to the new. If that's the case, you got to bring all that from the Old Testament over to the New, and it makes no sense. And therefore, you Christians don't understand the Bible as he pontificates and preaches, preaches to you and me what we should believe. Well, let me tell you this, man. You listen to the word of God that comes from the spirit of God from people who serve God. Right. You don't understand the spirit of the law. That's, right. that's your problem. Everything about a mystery in the Old Testament was talking about don't mix yourself so God can give a representation of the fact that we don't miss ourselves as Christians with anything. It does nothing to dis disavow or disallow the fact that a sodomite is an abomination before the living God because he said that he was. Old and New Testament. So as you pontificate to the church, you hear the word of the Lord. Cursed are you because you seek to change the word of the living God to try to prove a filthy, stinking, degenerated point that allows a man to lie with a man like he lies with a woman. And the very activity is filthy. As you dig around in feces all night like a dog. Call it what you want to. 
That's the way it is. Who would stand up to try to prove a point like that unless your mind was reprobate? Remember not you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what's, what's holding back that he might be revealed in this time. For the mystery of iniquity, deep abiding evil, a sinister element in the world, a mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now letteth, the word letteth means holds back. He that is holding this thing back will let, will hold it back until he be taken out of the way. Better stated, until he is removed from the middle. So this force is in the way holding back the mystery of iniquity.
And when he, this force, is removed, then the sinister mystery of iniquity will be seen by everybody. And then shall that wicked, capital W, a personal image of a person, a person is coming for the capital W letting you know that the word wicked is a title for a person. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. He's not going to consume a spirit with the spirit of his mouth. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. You see it in, the, in, in Revelation. That Jesus has been ordained to deal with the Antichrist himself. He comes to earth and he deals with the Antichrist personally. Cast him and the false prophet into a lake of fire. And later on they are both joined by Satan, the fallen angel that led them. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. With all power and signs and lying damnable wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Because they receive not the love of the truth. They receive not the love of the truth. They don't love the truth. You shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free. They receive not the love of their own freedom. Truth and freedom are synonymous. You know the truth. The truth makes you free. They don't love the truth. So they don't love their freedom. So when you come to set them free, what do they do? They resent you and they resist you because I don't want to be free. Truth is a freedom maker. It cuts you away from what? (coughs) Deception. The deception is what is binding you. Can't you see a lie is what bound you? So truth will set you free from it. But I don't want to be set free. I like the porno. I like the strip joints. I like being a lesbian. I like being a homosexual. I like cursing. I like lying. I like stealing. I don't want to be free. I like what I am. I like to wallow in this cesspool of sin. You know what? There is nothing you can do about it. I don't care if it's your son, your daughter, your mother, your father, your grandmother, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. If they are in covenant with their sin and they like it, the Bible instructs us to wipe our feet off against them as a witness and move on down the road. You, you got to get used to the hardcore substance of the Bible and the gospel. You can't be soft soaked in this and crying all day. You got a job to do. I get an assignment to do a job, I do my job. I don't ask questions about it, I'm not looking around for reinforcements. Give me my assignment, I carry it out. This is a military affair. It's a military engagement for military people. You got to be a soldier in an army. Trying to walk around as a civilian and a non-combatant. Guess what? You're not in any army and you're not going to make it in. You've been called to engagement against an enemy. The enemy of God. And for this cause God. Because they didn't love the truth. He said they didn't receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And he says that for this cause. Because they didn't want the truth. They didn't want freedom. God shall send them strong delusion. That they should believe a lie. Put faith in a lie. Why God? That they all might be damned. Who believed not the truth. But had pleasure in unrighteousness. Can't you see? I just told you why they didn't want the truth. They have pleasure in unrighteousness. I like Lady Gaga. I like hip hop. Folks try to get you to accept Hip hop in the gospel. God only receives back to heaven what he sent from heaven. And God didn't send hip hop. The word hip hop actually means booty shaking. So how can you have a hip hop gospel 
which says you have a booty shaking gospel. God didn't inspire booty shaking. But you know what those people don't want? They don't want the righteousness of Jesus Christ and they don't want to have the truth to set them free because they still like the hip hop. Don't bring it over here to us. We're not accepting it. Take it somewhere else. It's not coming into the household of the living God. We stand against it because it's the inspired trash of a fallen angel trying to make you believe you can bring that stinking, filthy trash into the, unbe- into the realm of the believers and have them admit and, it's, and submit to the trash the devil's propagating. It won't happen. Call it narrow-mindedness. Call it intolerant. Call it divisive. Call it unloving. Call it whatever you want to call it. He said to come out from amongst them. Don't bring them with you. Come out from amongst them. That's the spirit of Antichrist. It's a desecrator. If we let that trash in, along with the country and western gospel singers, and all the rest of them, we allow the desecrator in our midst and we become defiled by him. So you see now, God sends a strong delusion. <coughs> excuse me, so they will believe a lie. For the purpose of damning them. So don't, don't get God twisted in your thinking about what he will or won't do. He'll let the delusion come. The delusion is here now. It's sitting out there with Joel Lowstein 44,000 deep listening to a delusion. Creflo Dollar is, tra- is, tr- is tracking around the whole world with big, huge ministry seminars to bring forth a delusion. You see, the devil has set up ambassadors and prophets of delusion and God is letting it flow like a river. Oprah Winfrey was a witch sent to delude everybody. Get her own channel and get T.D. Jakes and, and all these other false prophets and false apostles tracking around talking about your best life now and how to be prosperous and how to be successful and how to do all these things to achieve success in this present evil world. And the folks buy in with everything they've got because they still love the world and they want something from it. You can only pimp a person If you have something they want. If you can offer them something. For the time spent with you. See a pimp. Doesn't offer a prostitute. He's pimping material possessions. He offers the prostitute. The acceptance of a daddy she never had. And she goes and sells herself all night. Because he's accepted me. And I never had this before. So it doesn't have to be material possessions that you get out of the deal. The sense of belonging. All these big, this big group of people, everybody cheering and got their hands raised and worshiping and all this stuff. And I'm one of them. I'm a world changer. Then you put it on your car tag and drag, drive around and everybody's saying, you one of those boobs that go over there? And you don't even know it. You think, well, we're in and you don't understand us. We've got it. And all the folks that know the truth are looking at you thinking, you've been totally deceived and you don't even know it. God sends the strong delusion that you will believe a lie. That you might be damned. Because you love yourself still and this life and this world and how you fit into it. Man, this is tragic. And it's real. It's happening right before our very eyes. You're looking at it every day. When you talk to one of those spirits, that's what you see draped over. They reject the truth. Or they come to the truth and take it lightly. You know how many people listening to this broadcast right now for entertainment? And what I say is funny and they laugh at it. You're going to be a damn soul because you don't take it seriously. You come to be entertained by it to see what I'm going to say next. 
or to see what's going to be controversial that you can go and get on Facebook about. You're going to be left out somewhere thinking you're in, looking at the thing go forth, and you won't be in it. Because it's all just a sideshow to you to entertain you. It's ugly, but it's real. First Kings. First Kings. And let's look at why everything seems to be just going on with nobody saying a word and the few people who do say something about it, they get marginalized and called cult teachers. And you know how I many folks come here and folks and you t- you hand a person a CD and they say, "They sound like you in a cult listening to that." That's why I only talk from the Bible line by line. You know, you're a cult member if you believe the Bible and listen and, and take the Bible face value line by line. That's the definition of a person in a cult to them. You actually believe the Bible? And they go to church every day. These are preachers that will downgrade belief systems to accommodate a lie. But one guy told a, a brother the other day, you see what you don't understand about Joel Osteen. He, he specializes, he has a specialized ministry whereby he's called to be an exhorter of people and to preach positives to them to motivate them. And that was the pastor of a church, supposedly. The pastor of a church of the damned telling a lie because he don't want a man up himself. 1 Kings 16. Look at verse 29. Look what he says. And in the thirty and eighth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria, Samaria twenty and two years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. But he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for, for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. In his days did Hiel the Bethelite build Jericho. He laid the foundations thereof in Abraham his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof in his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Joshua the son of Nun. So Ahab married Jezebel, set up idols to accommodate Jezebel. That's exactly what we have in front of us right now. Men are married to Jezebel spirits. And to accommodate the Jezebel spirits, the men stand for nothing. They escape to football games and basketball games and baseball games. And the ones that you see in front of you that appear to be in a pseudo authority, their wives run that. From the White House to the outhouse. That's what we got. That's why when you stand up against it, The guy that stands up in front of you is really standing up in the Jezebelian authority of his wife and matriarchy. You offend the matriarchal man. He's a metrosexual. I feel more comfortable sitting on the view with my legs crossed sitting between between Whoopi Goldberg and Barbara Walters than I do Talking to a man like Benjamin Netanyahu. Mm-hmm. Benjamin Netanyahu came from a warrior's family. His brother got killed as a soldier. Benjamin Netanyahu is a, is a commander in the army of Israel. You don't feel comfortable sitting across from him. Because he's a man of war. You, you feel better with your legs crossed talking to Whoopi Goldberg. You make me want to puke. That's why Netanyahu doesn't have any kind of respect for the presidency. I come as a man of war. I come to stand for something. And you get an attitude with me like a gal. 
And you want men to be namby-pamby and docile and stay quiet. They hear me talking. He seems as if, as if he's angry. He's just so angry and bitter. And he seems like he has animosity in his heart. And he seems like he's just so... I just can't receive it. That's not the spirit of the Lord. No, the spirit of the Lord you got is a matriarchal false spirit of the Lord because Jesus Christ is the commander of an army. He's the, the captain and the Lord of the host of God. That namby pamby sweet tea nickel and dime mess you're under, that jelly back mess you're listening to is not God. And it's going to cost you because God has to put some steel down in you for you to stand in austere times. I don't care if you're a man or a woman. You need some backbone in this. Because if you don't have backbone, the devil will walk up the front of you and down the back of you. And he won't care. He can only do three things to you. Steal from you, kill you, or destroy you. you. I'm telling you the practicalities of this. I'm telling you how you see it in front of you every day. Nothing Yahoo comes over here wants to meet. That's why you don't see a meeting. That's why you see all the, all the friction. But I can curl up and talk to David Letterman. Curl up with Whoopi Goldberg. And I can't even understand what Whoopi Goldberg just said. No man wants to sit around and jaw jack with a bunch of women all day like a hen at a hen party. Come on. A military man with a military background, a leader of a country. He has no way to interact with a soft soap, catamite, a matronized man walking around as a metrosexual. There is no compatibility there. You don't see, the message I'm preaching, you should see men lined up 10 blocks down the street for this. A normal man would say, hey, you know what, that's what I'm talking about right there. Let me, hey man, where do I sign up? Let's get on with this thing. Let's prosecute this war. Let's do this. They've been matronized. Even out of the football helmets, you got hair draped down out of the helmet. And two earrings on. And they prissy down the field trying to score a touchdown. That's the matronized man. Muscle-bound, big joker. But you call him up to a spiritual war, you see everybody headed the opposite direction, scared. You don't have any guts, man. We don't need cheerleaders on Facebook. Step up to the plate. We don't need accolades. We don't need attaboys. We don't need pats on the back. Step up to the plate. Let's see what you're made of. And because of Ahab marrying Jezebel... Verse 7, uh, chapter 17, verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite. I just love that name. Elijah the Tishbite. Man, I like this guy. Who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel liveth. Before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. He shut up heaven. And the rain and the dew shut down. If you can't see this, I don't know what to tell you. There's no rain. There's no dew in the church. Because of T.D. Jakes, Joe Lowstein, Creflo Dollar, Kenneth Copeland, and all these clowns who have married themselves to Baal, Jezebel and have built groves they call mega churches and the rain has stopped we need rain yes. Yes. I'm going to show you with, uh, with a lot of people seeing it and knowing this while the rain still doesn't fall we can get rain, but it's going to take 
commitment to something here that we don't we haven't seen it as of yet but God has a plan afoot if I know God God will never be outdone I don't preach this as a like a dreary depressed hopeless type of a thing God's got him some folks he's going to cut them loose you know why he doesn't as of yet he's trying to have mercy on those folk hung up between two opinions He's trying to look, I'm going to raise up. Now, when I raise up, you'll be out. So he's still extending a hand saying, look, get in. Get in. Commit. Well, watch this. He shut the heavens up. You know the story. He went down to the, to the brook Cher- Cherith. God fed him with a raven. And he drank from the brook. But he says in chapter 17... Verse 7, and it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. So the same rain that the prophet stopped is the same rain that was stopped that dried up the brook. So he moved on. You know the story. Went to the widow's house. The widow of Zarephath fed him with oil and, and, and a little bit of meal. And because she took care of the prophet, her oil and her meal never ran out. You know, everybody knows these stories now, I I guess, from reading the Bible. All this is doing what? Sustaining a man for a time appointed. God was keeping him alive for for a futuristic appointed event he was going to carry out. Just like he's doing the remnant of... Of the church right now. In hiding. Not on the scene. And he's got them. Keeping them. God has. An ace in the hole. That the devil. Can't get to. But the Bible talks about. The time of you being shown forth. To Israel. When God brings you out of the cave. And manifests you. Then we get. What we need to see. And it happens right here in 1 Kings 18. Let's look at this. And it came to pass, verse 1, after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab and I will send rain upon the earth. Now God makes it sound like, okay, just step out, show yourself to Ahab and then get on your horse and ride away and rain will come. But it was more to showing himself to Ahab than just letting Ahab see him. He went under command to go and see Ahab. As you know the story, Ahab and Obadiah were out trying to find some water for some for some uh, for herds to keep them alive. Obadiah was the servant of Ahab. And Elijah's headed back to see Ahab. And he runs across Obadiah first. So he runs into Obadiah, and Obadiah is basically scared to death of Elijah, because in verse 13 he says this, Was it not told my Lord that I did what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord? How I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave, and fed them with bread and water? And now you say, Go tell thy Lord, referring to Ahab, Behold, Elijah is here. And he shall slay me. And Elijah said, As the Lord of, of hosts liveth before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. So Obadiah told Elijah, Look, if I go and tell Ahab you're here, and I bring him back and you're gone, the king is going to kill me. He said, No, man, go get him. I'll be here when he gets back. See, that's it right there, man. Nobody running. What you ducking and hiding for? You represent the armies of the living God. What are we ducking around corners for and trying to hide out for? Feeling funny because you read your Bible in the break room for lunch. And when folks walk around you feel kind of, you know, self-conscious that you got your Bible out and all that. They, hey man, you need to read this Bible like me. I don't need to be like you. You bring nothing to the table. You need to be like me. We're almost apologetic for being a Christian. When the world needs Christianity. 
They're lost as they mock you and joke at you and make jokes of you and try to talk about you and play the dozens with you and try to put you down and, and make fun of you and laugh at you. Man, a smile is just a frown turned upside down. Who's laughing today will be crying tomorrow. Laugh on, good buddy. He who laughs, laughs last will always laugh best. So he went to meet Ahab. And look what Ahab said. Verse 17. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah. That Ahab said unto him. Art thou he that troubles Israel? Hand, hand one of these CDs. To your mama and daddy. And they'll say. This, this troubles me. This, this, this right here is judgmental. This is nothing but hate mongering. I can see from what's being said here they're homophobic. It's easy to tell that they have no real knowledge of how God is because God is love. God would never do this to us because God loves us so much. It's not a question of God loving us. It's a question of us loving God. They will see you as the troublemaker. You're infringing upon my comfort zone. Just to mention abortion is murder and I've, I've aborted two babies. You trouble. So you're troubling the environment. Everybody in here was being quiet. And the first thing that people will tell you, I don't discuss religion and I don't discuss politics. You know what they just really say it? I don't discuss the Antichrist and I don't discuss the whore of Babylon. The two entities through which Satan's government will be formulated. That's why people don't talk about it. Because their master the devil told them not to talk about it. Because this is where I'm sitting up my citadel of evil. So don't talk about politics. And religion because politics and religion is what I'm using to control the world hands off cause all it's going to do is start an argument you see how the devil is the devil is so cunning that if that clown wasn't evil I would probably follow him cause this guy can put together some stuff that is so right he can get a mind so convoluted in his thinking that you'll call good evil and evil good. Right will be left and left will be right. Black is white, white is black. Up is down and down is up. And you'll know you're right. You're totally twisted in your thinking and you're absolutely sure you're right. And you're as wrong as two left shoes. That's Satan's handiwork. Don't discuss religion and politics. We don't talk about religion and politics. We talk about the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we talk about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't talk about religion. We talk about a relationship with a, ris a risen Savior. And they try to mark that as religion and politics. That's the devil at his best. You trouble Israel. And he answered, I have not troubled Israel but you and your father's house. And that you have forsaken the commandment of the Lord and you have followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal 450. And the prophets of the groves 400 which eat at Jezebel's table. You see the prophets of the groves. Are the feminine preachers. Who sit with Jezebel. What did Jezebel do to them? She had sex with all of them. She put herself in all of them. She effeminized them. So they won't stand up against anything. The groves were the female images. So the, the groves were nothing but carved out wooden poles. With female images on them. They worship the breasts. They worship the vaginas. They worship the, the, the curve of the buttocks, buttocks. 
They worship the legs. They worship the eyes. They worship the hair. They worship the lips. They worship Kim Kardashian, Beyonce. Go down the list of them. Rihanna, Madonna, Shakira, or Shakira. They worship all these folks. The female countenance is set up on a pedestal to be worshipped. Britney Spears, Madonna, Nicki Minaj, Lady Gaga. Watch how every guy that gets called up in one of them becomes effeminate. He'll be just like a girl. Stand for nothing, no gonads, no guts. These are the prophets of the groves in the pulpits. They prophesy smooth things. They act just like a girl. No military command. The same way Netanyahu won't meet with Barack Obama is the same way the real preachers and teachers and prophets of God have no affiliation with these effeminized, little wimpy, tiptoe through the tulip guys. They look like Tiny Tim strumming a ukulele. You ever seen Mr. and Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Perfect? Y'all never seen those characters, Mr. and Mr. Mr. Mrs. Perfect? They come to your door and they smile. Hi, welcome to the neighborhood. I always got a smile on their face. Go, oh, glad you came here. Here's a cake for you. Y'all never seen those characters, Mr. and Mrs. Perfect? That's Joel Osteen. <laughs> Always with that old stupid smile on his face like everything's great. In the middle of a slaughterhouse, Mr. Perfect, Mr. Terrific, underdog, and all this kind of stuff. Look, man, what are you doing? We're in the middle of hell, a Babylonian invasion. Hell is on the streets, and you got this crazy smile on your head, on your face, like somebody that's lost their mind and telling folks their best life is now. Mr. Perfect and his wife, Mrs. Perfect. Mm-hmm. You ever seen that guy on that commercial riding the, the lawnmower? Hi, my name is Bill. Yeah. I'm in seven million dollars worth of debt, and I'm keeping up with my neighbors, and I don't have anything. My house is just foreclosed on. My kids are crazy. Hi. That's the spirit behind that whole arena appended to Joel Osteen. Escaping from reality, pretending like everything is beautiful. Like it's a bright sunny day and clouds are everywhere and it's pouring rain and thunder and lightning just cascading down on, on the earth. And you're acting like everything is beautiful. God does not escape into fantasy. He tells you how it really is and he won't allow us to imagine an imaginary gospel. So he said, I didn't trouble Israel, you did. You and all these little weak neat prophets you hired to do your bidding. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And here's where we're at right now. And the people answered him not a word. All of you folks by stick'em, everybody listening to this CD, everybody within the sound of my voice, you identified the wrong, but you won't come and join what's right. You hide behind Facebook all day with quips, quotes, and sayings, analyzing messages, but you won't engage the enemy. You're a hypocrite. You have been halted between two opinions. You see what's wrong, but you know doing the right is volatile. It's going to cost me my life. And if I stand up and represent it in a public arena, they're liable to kill me. 
So I want to cheer you guys on. But I'm not getting in myself. You are going to be damned. With those that would not represent Jesus here. It's so volatile. That if I mention. Financially supporting what we're doing. They try to make me Creflo Dollar too. That's how warped your mind can become in this. When you say, man, get on board, support this, and let's go. You see the message is not the same. You see what we're doing. Or are you just like Craft Low Dollar? The devil's got your mind twisted in knots. You can't do the wrong and don't have the guts to do the right. And all you do all day is stand there outside of the whole warfare as a civilian. Writing reports on the war. A spectator. In a demilitarized zone. Don't try to tell a guy in the middle of the Vietnam War what it's like to fight in, a Viet- in the Vietnam War. I fought the war. So you can't bring anything to a person that is experientially doing something and try to give any kind of a inf- any information to that person. Don't tell me about casting out devils. Have you ever cast out a devil? What do you know about casting out a devil? What will they do? How do they react? What goes on when you're casting out a devil? What will they say to you? What will they do to you? How do you feel inside when you're casting out a devil? Everything in this gospel is experiential. It's not made for spectators. It's designed for participants. So you got to depend on God's ram in the bush. You got to depend on God's 7,000 that didn't bow the knee to Baal that's mean business. You got to depend on those men of of David's uh, army who said we are going to make David the king. Let's march and, and bring David to enthronement. You got to depend on a man like Benjamin Netanyahu, even as a Jew who doesn't know Christ. He's got guts. He's got guts enough to let you know Israel is not going to be destroyed. Anybody that threatens us with nuclear war. Ahmadinejad can stand in the UN all day and spew out that trash he's spewing out. But while he's talking, we've got F-16s already being armed. You better know those Israelites ain't playing. While they're talking at the UN, those boys are loading for bear. And you got a gutless, spineless president over here. He'll override him. You know why he can? Because the archangel fights with them. Michael the archangel stands with Israel. You'd be a fool to deal with Israel. Because there are legions of angels that fight with Israel. Netanyahu doesn't even know the power that stands with him. He don't even know. He don't even know that in the spirit world, legions of angels have been committed by God to to the protection of Israel. You know what? I'm with him. If the United States turns against Israel, guess what? I'm with Israel. You are against Israel, but I am with Israel. Because my loins, my destiny, my heritage is grounded and rooted in Israel, not here. You got to get a mind that's totally transformed to walk in this. The man doesn't even know who he is. And Lord have mercy if he became a Messianic Jew that found Jesus Christ. Good Lord. I like, I, I'd probably move over there and, and try to be his assistant or something. These are forces at war. And you got folks in gray areas afraid to commit to either side. And they just hide behind Facebook and Twitter and Google and any other social medium you can name. And they talk all day like chickens with their heads cut off. You got to understand this. You better understand this. We're not here to talk. We're preparing people for conflict. 
if you're sitting there thinking this is going to go on like this, you're deceiving yourself. Because God's going to bring this to a head. And when he says go, everybody that's been marshaled for war is moving out. And you'll still be on Facebook and tweeting. That sounds sissy. I'm here over here tweeting. Man, look, man, what are you doing? Put down that cell phone. And pick up the word of God as a sword of the spirit. Folks are kidding themselves. They're kidding themselves all along the trail. See, Jeremiah looked like a fool to Nebuchadnezzar came over the over the ridge over there. What's that coming over there? Like a couple of horses. That's four horses. That's thirty horses. That's ten thousand that's a hundred thousand horses. See, he was a fool until, until Nebuchadnezzar came over that ridge. And the armies of Babylon poured into Israel and burned the place to the ground. And took all the wisest people in Israel back to Babylon. They left a contingent of, of, of little vagabonds and folk in, in Israel. But the wisest, most astute people, he took back to Babylon to use and exploit them and their wisdom. See, see Nebuchadnezzar is not a fool. He ties up the most astute people to use them. Daniel, the three Hebrew boys. That's who all these folks were. The wisest of the wise in Israel he took back to Babylon. So here we are. We got the same circumstance again verbatim. They're in the church houses lined up on every street corner. The prophets of the groves. You don't believe it? Come and, come and tell them the truth that I'm telling you right now. Watch how they stand against you. The people who you see who stand against truth are those that have been brainwashed by the prophets of the groves. They can hear what I'm saying and they'll turn to you and you know they'll tell you. I don't understand what he's talking about. I am mean, not speak with a southern drone, but good night. You can't understand what I'm saying. I'm saying that you got no guts and you can't understand that. What's hard to understand about that? But see, they sit there, brainwashed by this effeminate, emaciated, matronized spirit governed by Jezebel's yoke. And they just sit there and they answered him not a word. They were non-committal. We will not commit to anything. We just stand and talk all day and evaluate. Talk about. Analyze. Theorize. Hypothesize. Look man, move out of the way. You're debris in the way. We're about to do a job and we don't have time for your kind. Because you're not for real, not even with yourself. That's what we've come up against. We're sitting up here in a slaughterhouse with all these babies being butchered on a daily basis with everybody talking all day. Talking's got to come to an end. You know the story. Elijah went down, confronted the prophets of Baal, put an offering on the altar. They tried to get Satan to burn up the altar, the sacrifice on the altar. Satan didn't move because Elijah wouldn't let him. Mm. Spirit of God and Elijah stood there and said, ain't no demons coming up in here. I'm shutting it down. Nobody answers here. He calls on God. God answers by fire. He burns up everything in sight, burns up the sacrifice, burns up all the water they doused the altar with, burned up everything. The God that answers by fire. And it loosed the people's tongues. Isn't it amazing how they didn't answer my word, they were quiet. But all of a sudden, everybody can talk. After God displayed himself. And what did they say? The Lord. the Lord. He is the God. Verse 39 in chapter 18. And the people said the Lord. He is the God. And look what Elijah said. And Elijah said unto them. Take the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they took them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Tishon. And slew them there. 
a slaughter of the false prophets. Don't you know that all these lying wonders we see in front of us are headed to a slaughter? And everybody that follows them will be involved in the same slaughter. The Bible says blind leaders of the blind all headed to a ditch. They're going to a slaughter. A bunch of lying hypocrites living off of the people. Setting the people up for their demise. It's ugly. It's terrible what's happening. And people stay straight are staying strangely quiet. Feeling funny, funny when they confront somebody. Because we've been made into, into domestic people. You ever heard of a domesticated animal? I, I guarantee you most Christians. I don't have to be there. Most Christians in a confrontation. Leave that confrontation shook up. And wondering did I do the right thing? Should I have said that? I don't want to be here. And somebody will always, always accuse you. I thought you was a Christian. You say you you just so 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 angry and you so no. Let me tell you something, man. Let me tell you what I'm, I'm gonna tell you this so you can understand it real plain. The devil is down here like a madman, raping, pillaging, and destroying everything in sight. Anybody with any kind of righteousness has a righteous indignation about Satan. Trampling people underfoot, especially the most innocent people on this planet. The Bible says the righteous person even stands up for the poor. These heathens are sitting in pulpits and they're taking all of these poor folks' money to live off of. Flying around in Learjets and driving Rolls Royces, promising these poor people they are going to get a return on a seed faith offering and I'm supposed to stay quiet and when you stand up they want to accuse you of being argumentative angry call me what you want to and then they try they finally downgraded to this one thing that I hate well we're both Christians so I guess we'll have to just agree to disagree now let me tell you this man You're not a Christian I am I don't agree with anything you say Because you're a damnable liar And that filth you're espousing is wrong And there's no agreement in us whatsoever And you're not a Christian Because a Christian can come to the truth And represent it and you won't You're deceiving yourself Now you're proud now you think you know everything. Now you're arrogant. Now you think that you're, you're holier than thou. You think that you You can't downgrade this. You can't let this spirit off the hook. You have to talk loud. I tend to talk loud, but that's just me. You're never... As long as you live. You can forget trying to do this too because you'll be crazy if you try. You'll never disengage God from your emotions. If God gets mad, you'll get mad. If somebody's standing in front of you and God gets mad at them, guess what you're going to feel? You'll feel mad. Because that's the feeling of God coming through you. And it's going to come up out of you. You don't believe it? If you think that Jesus was laughing and, and calm when he had that whip in his hand beating those folk, you're crazy. If you think Elijah right here is sitting there talking softly, you are crazy. If you think John the Baptist confronted Herod and Herodias in a soft-spoken monotone, you're crazy. Because you're going to feel exactly what the Spirit of God feels when he feels it. So you can't try to act any kind of a way. If you do that, you're an abomination and an idolater. Because I'm trying to make sure I act loving. Define that. You're trying to still be a hypocrite, a play actor. I'm trying to act like the world says I should act if I'm a Christian. I don't downgrade anything for them. What you see, good buddy, is what you get. If God wants to change me, he'll change me. Until then, I'm coming at you with both barrels blasting. Because the world... It, it, man, it is an expert 
it is it, it, it mistaking kindness for weakness. They define what you should act like as a Christian. I thought you were as a Christian. What makes you think that you are an expert on how a Christian is? You think I, you thought I was a Christian. How am I supposed to be? You're not a Christian. You have nothing to do with defining me. I thought you were a Christian. They say that with a preconceived notion about how a Christian should act. If you have a preconceived notion about how a Christian should act, you are an idolater. This is the real thing over here. God is not going to separate himself from, from your emotions. He's going to move the spirit right into your emotions. If you get happy, if he gets happy, you'll feel happy. If it's something he's sad about, you'll feel sad. If it's something that displeases him, you'll be displeased with it. Nothing changes. How do you think you make decisions? How do you know what's wrong or right? People ask me all the questions, questions all the time. What I think about stuff and how do I see it? They hear what I'm saying and they figure, well, his opinion may be of value. Let me hear your take on it. And I end a lot of things saying you don't have to believe it, but this is how I see it. Now go pray about it and see what he tells you. A lady emailed me the other day about fasting. And she was talking about how to go on a Daniel fast. And, you know, should I do this? Should I do that? It was a, it was a, 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 a normal question about how to fast and what should I eat and how did Daniel fast? What didn't Daniel eat? What did he eat? I simply told her, look, very quick answer. Pray to God. Eat what he tells you to eat because you are not Daniel. That's simple. I don't know what Daniel ate or what he didn't eat. I'm not Daniel. To actually act, try to act like a Bible uh, personality is idolatry and emulations. I'm not Peter. See, if you use Paul or Peter or James or John or anybody in the Bible as your uh, characterization of how you're going to be or what you're going to achieve, I don't know how far they went. Paul might have fell short for all I know. I don't know what more God could have done if Paul didn't have certain limitations. Why would I use a Bible character as my example? Jesus is the standard, not a Bible character. I don't know. And Jesus has no bottom, no height. Jesus is eternal. How far can you take this thing as an individual? Don't use other people as your examples, no matter if they're in the Bible or not. You have to lock into this thing for you. And you have to go for you. That's the bottom line. You have to know God for yourself. So you see now. All the while this drought was going on that that Elijah called for. You have what we're having now. In a drought with no rain. There's no vegetation. The crops are failing. the, the, The herds are drying up and starving to death. What you'll have is scavengers. People will begin to scavenge for food. So they're trying to find something to eat. So Jake's, Joel Osteen, all the Joyce Myers, Creflo Dollar, Kenneth Copeland, all these folks are able to feed people who are scavengers. There is no word from God that I can see. There is no anointing. There is no outpouring of the Holy Ghost. So I'm just eating any old thing I can find. I found a dried up dead cockroach over in the corner. I barbecued it. They're scavengers. Eating any trash you put in front of them. And called it the word of God. Scavengers. In a drought. That's why we need latter rain to fall. A lie is being told to folks about, about, about escaping suffering and tribulation. Look at Daniel chapter 3 real fast. We'll, shoot, we'll smooth through it to take a look at it. To prove one point to you real fast. Folks are being told that you're not going to suffer. You're not going to go through anything. God loves you so much that nothing will come nigh thee. 
The three Hebrew boys here in Daniel chapter 3 were commanded by Nebuchadnezzar. Look what he says. Daniel 3, 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof was six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So you see now, you got an image that's 60 cubits high. Six cubits wide. So you got six and a six. And he set it up in the plain of Dura. You got what you got there. Illustrating this, the image of man in its totality. Six, the two sixes. The number six is always the number of man. Man created on the sixth day. Nebuchadnezzar commanded them when you hear the instrumentation sound, when you hear music played, everybody has to bow down and worship this image that I set up. You know the story. The three Hebrew boys, they refused to bow down. They would not worship this image. As a result, the penalty was to be cast into a fiery furnace and burned to death. Since you got to fall down, they refused to do it. That the fiery furnace, in the fiery furnace, you must go. That was their penalty. So, it says, in verse 19 of chapter 3, Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage, visage was changed again against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which were their Babylonian names. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. The seven times more reflects the seven years of the tribulation period that we will enter into because we won't bow to the world system that's coming right now. We're not going to worship the image of your man, the Antichrist. The seven times hotter is the seven years of tribulation that follows the fact that you won't bow. He that letteth has been removed from the middle. And now the, the end time sequences begin. And the first command is... You will bow to the image of my man, speak, Satan speaking, the Antichrist. You will bow to his government. You will be a member of his ecumenical religious system. You will not make any waves. And you say, I will not bow to this filth. I stand against it. You know what you're going to get at that time? A falling away. See, America is like a bubble in the midst of anarchy. We have a pseudo-freedom here. We believe everything is lovely. You can't filter the Bible through Americanized thinking. Christians globally are under severe persecution and hatred all the time. From the governmental systems they live up under. North Vietnam. China. The Sudan, all these Islamic republics, they hate Christians. But the political system supporting the hatred. Guess what? In America, they hate Christians. But the political system hadn't turned yet. That's the only thing that it gives us what appears to be like a grace. The only thing that has kept America over the years is the fact that America stood with Israel. That's it. When America steps away from Israel, God steps away from America. I will bless them that bless you, and I will curse them that curse you, referring to Israel. Forces are already at work in this nation to have us step away from Israel. See, God uses two things. He used the spirit world with Michael the Archangel and that force. And he uses a physical military force through the American army to protect Israel. So, see, it's, it's logical. Think about it logically. Why would he use a physical fighting force 
and a spiritual force. If you look at it logically. So the people can see it. So the people can see it. See, Iran can't see the mic of the archangel. But they can see that aircraft carrier sitting right there. You see what I'm saying? It's not that Michael the Archangel is not there. But see, the people have to see something physical. Now, if they attacked and America didn't defend them, that angelic army would defend them. They already did it one time. Yeah. Eight-day war. Four, that's right. Three or four million Israelites. Forty million Arabs. That's impossible. And then took their land from them in the, while they fought the war. And won't give it back. <laughs> I like everything about this. And nobody can figure it out. A little tiny strip of land looking like a postage stamp on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean. And everybody all in the uproar about this little strip of land. The Palestinians could be moved to all these huge nations with all this land and given. Why are you so concerned about this little piece of land?
Because that's God's land. In the midst of the devil's worldly kingdom. God has staked out his, his land. In the midst of your stinking filthy world system devil. This land is my land. It's like the old song. This land is my land. This land is your land. This land was made for you and me. That's God's land. It was like, well, they live, he didn't care who lived there. I'm taking this and I'm giving it to Abraham's lineage. And nobody's going to take it from them. Man, it's so pitiful to watch folk debating about what they're going to do about Israel. When it's already settled in this book. I'm with them. Anybody you hear talking about a Jew, get away from them. The old Jews, all they do is love money. The Zionists, all they are. Hey man, uh, I think you better move over there. Because whatever hits you, I don't want to hit me. Jesus is a Jew. To talk about his brethren is to talk about him. And I'm not doing it. Folks don't like that. They don't like it when you say that. You'll be amazed at how many things people don't like for you to say. That are just germane to the Christian faith. While they claim to be Christians. They went through the fiery furnace. I'm trying to prove this point. That that seven years, that seven times hotter is reflecting the severe heat of the, of the seven years of tribulation. And notice this. Look what happened. He threw them in. They weren't, born, they weren't burned at all. Nebuchadnezzar jumps up. He looks inside the furnace in verse 25. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Notice how you get loosed in the furnace, and Jesus is in the furnace with you. A lot of folks try to debate, well, that might have been an angel. That might have been. It was God's presence in the furnace, man. If an angel was sent from Jesus, Jesus is there. Represented by the angel. That makes no difference who it was. Weird minds will debate anything. But the point I'm making is. Saved or kept in the midst of the furnace. And Jesus is with them 100% in the fiery tribulation of the furnace. A damnable life being preached. Left behind. The Christians leave. You're not going to be impacted by this. Supernatural substance must come to bear on us. You can't buy or sell without a mark of the beast. I'm not taking one. I'm not in I'm not going into that. I'm not bowing to the beast. We're going to find out just who God is supernaturally. God is going to prove like he did to these Hebrew boys. You don't need the world to sustain you. You know how I many people, whether they know it or not, are totally dependent on their job. Totally. Well, what about when you can't come to your job unless you got the mark of the beast? That encoding on you is what's letting you in the front door. That encoding on you is what activates your computer at your desk. See, we don't use login passwords anymore. You got to have the mark. Now, you depend totally on your job and the world. You got to be delivered from that now to be able to stand then. Let them take all your stuff. Y'all you know, can have all this stuff. You owe me for it. Well, time to get it. Back the truck up to the house and take it. Well, what about the house? Well, take the house too. Here, you want these shoes I got on too? Here, I'll throw this on the pile. Here. What difference does it make when the age has come to an end anyway? And you're trying to hold on. You know why people hate this message? Because they don't, they don't identify the fact that the Bible is not about you living here. The Bible is preparation for you living after this life. You're living to live again. Most folk are not ready for God. Because they still place all their trust in the here and now and life on earth. 
the graveyard proves my point. I can't be wrong. Because every one of us are going to die. That's so hopeless. That's so doom and gloom. Why? It's going to happen. It's reality. It's going to happen. You're going to die. Where are you going after you die? The sinner doesn't even want to process that. Because I want to enjoy this. This is why a message like Have Your Best Life Now by Joel Osteen draws thousands of people. Because he knows instinctively they don't want to think about eternal life and their destiny after this life and standing before a living God to receive judgment for what they've done. So I take all the sinners and all the hypocrites and all the religious folk that don't know Jesus and I tell them about having their best life now and the gospel is then perverted to tell you it's about you having a life now to enjoy. And the streets are bathed in blood as we sit up in a slaughterhouse with almost 60 million babies butchered. And the vacuum extraction hoses start tomorrow morning at 7.30. And the saline solution will be poured into somebody's womb by 7.45 a.m. While you're sipping coffee around the water cooler at work talking about that the Pittsburgh Steelers win or lose today. And the blood will be flowing like a river under your feet. And everybody wants to be happy. You better consign yourself to the fact that you are not going to be happy again. Joy is a constant. Get rid of, get rid of a search for happiness. On this planet. The news tonight will immediately cut that smile off of your face. And stop you from feeling happy. Stop looking for satisfaction here. It doesn't exist. There is no meaning to life here. It doesn't exist. All the lies that are propagated down here are trying to get people to search out a meaning for existence here. All the stuff on Oprah. All the, what's the guy's name, Deep, Deepak Chopra. All that teaching. All the Scientology. All the Dianetics. All the motivational speakers are trying to give folks hope for here. I'm here to tell you now the Bible says if you, if you have hope only in this life, you are of all men most miserable. Because there is no hope in this life because you're going to die. Your kids are going to die. Your mother and father are going to die. Your dog Spot is going to die. Your cat Muffin is going to die. Your bird is going to die. Everything's going to die. And stink and body worms are going to eat it up. Isn't it funny how the worms that eat you up in the grave are already in you? Body worms come out of you to eat you. All flesh is grass. I'm glad. That, now that makes me happy. You got to have a transformed mind to walk in this. It doesn't bring hopelessness to you. It doesn't make you cry. You like it. Heard a preacher say, man, it was a meeting they had. One man got up, a preacher, very astute man, brilliant control of the English language, vocabulary, oratory, pronunciation, enunciation, perfect. He stood up and he quoted the, the Bible. He pulled out Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He got through speaking and the whole room erupted in applause for the magnificent job he did speaking. Old beat up man got up and said, I want to say a few words too. Couldn't hardly talk, half dead. Couldn't hardly pronounce anything. He read the psalm just like the man did, Psalm 23. When he got through, the whole room was just broken down crying. Everybody crying like a baby. And the, or the orator said, I read Psalm 23. No one, sh no one shed a tear. 
no one cried. Why did he read it? The same thing I read and everybody's crying. Man tapped him on the shoulder and said, look fella. You know Psalm 23. He knows the shepherd that it's written about. That's the difference in a real Christian. You know letter. I know the man that wrote it. That moves you into another realm. I'm not dependent on making that help based on what I know. It's who I know. Who do you belong to? Who do you love? That's faith. Faith and love are power twins. You don't have faith in anybody you don't love. If you love him, you'll stay with him. Faithless people don't love him. You're a preacher, three kids, and you leave your wife, you don't love the Lord. Don't have nothing to do with your wife and another woman. You don't love the Lord. If you love me, obey my commandments. This is a military affair. It's a military affair. Don't have nothing to do with how I feel about it. I do as I am told. If you have a track record with the Lord, you don't leave the Lord. Because I know what he brought me from. I know what I was. I know the shame and the guilt and filth of sin. I don't want to go back to that filth again. The goodness of the Lord will keep you when you know him. Folks that don't know him, they don't have any inclination to serve him. And they won't sell out to other folks and with other folks that are serving him. There'll be spectators on Facebook talking all day. I was looking at a guy today or yesterday who had been taught from one of my messages about a woman pastor. And the spirit on him from listening to the message made the woman pastor begin to hate him. Without him saying a word about it, he had been under the auspices of another spirit. And they know when you are coming out of covenant with them. They know when you're not going to bow down to the idols anymore. Nebuchadnezzar's idol is raised up and I will not bow anymore. So they told him, you better get out of here because you don't fit in. You got a devil in you. Somebody got a devil in them, but it's not him. Because this word says the qualifications for a pastor. They know when another spirit is in their midst that won't succumb to the lies and the delusions of the devil. And that's a good thing. I pray for the brother to make it out, stand strong. He came out of homosexuality. I can say that because he says it. And he wants to be washed clean of every vestige of that feminine characterization of himself so he can walk around as a man. And that woman pastor was going to undermine his development, placing him under matriarchy to make sure he remained feminine. But bless God, if you search for your manhood, if you search and seek out God to really be free, God will set you free. And he won't let you step up under that which will undermine your seeking out your own freedom. Because one thing you better know about God, God is faithful. He will do what he said that he will do. I heard R.D. Hinton say, the problem with this generation is we don't have sticking power. So it used to be in the old days, if your husband wasn't saved, you stayed down before God and God broke him down and saved him. Now you get a divorce. Now you find an easy way out. There is no easy way out of this. It takes hours of prayer, fasting, asking, seeking, knocking, warring against a contrary enemy that refuses to abdicate power. You're not going to get the devil to give up power. He must be made to give up power. He must be confronted and he must be destroyed. The Son of God was manifested in the flesh to destroy the works of the devil. It's a seek and destroy mission we're on. We're looking for the devil to to undermine and destroy his strongholds on people's lives. This is not about weak need people looking for an easy way out. This is for warriors. This is a war cry. 
Anything else? You're kidding yourself. We're living in a world and a nation that's slaughtering the most innocent people in sight. Don't you know they'll slaughter you? If they'll slaughter the most innocent, what are they going to think about slaughtering you? Jesus said they killed me. They, they hanged me on a tree. If they butchered me and crucified me in a green tree, what do you think they're going to do in a dry tree? The Israelites who had the commandments, had the laws, had all the prophets. I came to them. They killed me in a green tree where the sap was running. See, a green tree has sap running in it. The life of God was interacting with Israel. The Gentiles don't even know God. And Christians will be birthed amongst the Gentiles. They crucified me in a green tree. What do you think they'll do to you in a dry tree? Stop hoping and, 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 and wishing it's going to be different. You read this Bible and you take it at face value and you walk in what it says. You can't afford to wish and dream now. Because it's not going to be pretty and you, want, you don't want to imagine that it will. Look at Matthew chapter 10. We stay within the confines of the Bible. So there will be no guesstimating and estimating anything we say it. What does the Bible say? Not what I think, not what you think. What does the Bible reveal? Matthew 10, 26, Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. When I, what I tell you in darkness, that speak you in light. And what you hear in the ear, that preach you under the house, upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear you not therefore you are, you are of more value than, any spar- than many sparrows. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men. Him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. In an environment like the one we're entering into, where to speak against homosexuality and effemininity and lesbianism and, and, uh, and abortion and all the things the sinners do, to confess Christ before these kinds of people is going to take a heavy anointing of the Holy Ghost that's been birthed in you by prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. Staying down until you have been transformed to be a vessel of God that will not flinch in austere conditions. You can't fake this by trying to look like you're brave. Or look like you're, you know, you're going to stand because this thing will make you buckle. It will make you run in fear. Well, listen, listen to Hinton another time. He said he had just gotten saved with a young Christian. He, gonna go on, he was going on a fast in his house and, and, and praying in dark. And he kept hearing all these noises and stuff. Next thing you know, the devil had chased him from his place of prayer. Scared to death because something was in the room with him. And he heard this thing coming in and walking around. He ran from his place of prayer. That's pretty pitiful. You're praying to God. And the devil make you run out the door screaming. Scared of what's in the room. Sitting right here. See right now your, your soul right now is in a restful state. You don't feel tribulation and animosity and shaking inside of you. Because you're in a passive state. You watch when things occur that people don't expect. You watch how they change. They start running around like chickens with their heads cut off. A car wreck on the street. Somebody is beheaded in front of you. Somebody killed dramatically in front of you. Bloodletting all around you. Watch how your soul will tribulate. It'll just go into a frenetic state all by itself. Unless you're anchored to Jesus Christ. 
things can happen around you so fast. Because if you're not anchored in Christ, you could be thrown into a state of fear so, so fast you won't know what hit you. And fear will make you petrified. That's why they answered Elijah not a word. Petrify means to convert an organic object into stony material. To make or become rigid or inert like stone. To make lifeless or inactive. To deaden. To confound with fear, amazement or awe. To paralyze you. The end times will paralyze you if you don't have Jesus Christ. Imagine standing in front of a Nazi stormtrooper, an SS soldier, somebody whose heart was just like granite against anybody that was not in complete submission to Hitler. The cold bloodedness of that person, no emotions, no feelings, would kill you as soon as look at you. That's what's going to be in the streets down here. You can be stopped by some traffic cop that are like that right now. No human emotions. No feelings. A robot. An automaton. The exterminator. The terminator. The terminator was a robot in the movie. He had no feelings. He had one objective. To kill that woman. Notice how everything they threw at him. He had one objective. I'm going to kill this woman. Terminator. Programmed to terminate. So what you're going to have? So you're dealing with humans. But you don't know the power of a demon when it's taken over that human. And you have no longer a man in front of you. You don't have an animal in front of you. You've got a manimal. A man that's an animal inside. A demon is a blood thirsty killer that will kill you Christians tiptoeing around with these lightweight Lilliputian preachers they won't be able to stand up under this inferno that's why the Bible says who can stand in the midst of an inferno you gotta have clean lips and clean hands you gotta be totally repentant and cleansed and washed from your sins to stand in this you gotta know God not know about God Group settings and other people won't be able to stand up under you as crutches to hold you up now. When they get you alone, when the bright lights are on you and you're interrogated, do you still confess Christ? With the bloody guillotine right outside the door, what do you do now? When they take your little three-year-old daughter out there and behead her, the threat of beheading her, do you change your story now? The devil's got leverage, and he'll use it. So you got to get this straight in you now. This society and this culture is lulling people to sleep. This was a country that had Judeo-Christian ethics in it. So the devil didn't attack this country the same. All he did was change his tactics. He knew it had a Judeo-Christian ethic. So he he moved in and smoothed into the religious arena. To make you believe this is America. And these things will never happen here. And now he's tipping the scale. He's got candidates now running where you have no representative for you. I got idolatry on the left and idolatry on the right. I got it, buddy. I got you where I want you. If you think a Mormon can get into the White House and hear from God, you better think again. You got no pony in this race and I'm so glad and now you can't come and try to make me believe like they did up here at Liberty University with Mitt Romney that he is a man that we have to stand behind because he represents our values. You're a liar and, a, and the truth is not in you. That idolatrous mess. If you can believe that idolatrous mess, what else can you believe? You have to be almost crazy to believe that stuff they believe. 
And you want me to stand with this? Stand with an abortionist? A homosexual enabler? On the left? And an idolater and a false god worshiper on the right? Christian, you have no pony in this race. Turn toward heaven. Go vertical. Forget the horizontal. Go vertical. Become an ambassador for Christ. Represent Christ to the lost world. That's what God is doing. He's forcing us to choose heaven or earth. God or Baal. And they answered him not a word. Hung up. I came out from what I saw that was false. But I won't go into that which is real. You can come out of Egypt all day. But look how many were afraid to take the promised land. They died in a wilderness of wandering. With no meaning to life. Because they wouldn't commit either way. You and I have been brought down to a valley of decision. It's a slaughterhouse. They start killing the babies. It's going to ramp up to killing you. You don't believe it? Keep reading right here. Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace but a sword, a war. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother. And the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. That's a promise. So stop trying to wonder why your mom and your daddy don't like you. That's a promise from the Lord Jesus Christ. If you got saved and they're religious, they go to the Calvinist Baptist church down the street telling you once saved, always saved. And you got saved and came to the living God and was born again. Then you're at variance with them now because they're believing a lie based on Calvinism. And a man's foe shall be there of his own household. He that knoweth, he that loveth father or more, mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. When they take your three-year-old daughter outside wanting to behead her and you deny Christ to save her, you're not worthy of Jesus Christ. And he that taketh not his cross and follows after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. We're here. If we review it all, what do we have? We have shepherds of damnation. Preaching to these people to lead them into their own demise. Shepherds of damnation that will not tell them the truth. The Bible calls them dumb dogs that will not bark. They will not tell you the truth because to tell you the truth is going to take millions of dollars out of their hands and they're living off of you like leeches. They tell you lies and you pay them for the lies. Isn't that a, isn't that a mess? You're paying a person to damn your soul to hell. And you're paying them to do it. Shepherds of damnation. Psalm 44, 20 through 26. I'll just read this. You don't have to go there. If we have forgotten the name of our Lord or stretched out our hands to a strange God, shall not God search this out for he knows the secrets of the heart? Yes, for thy sake are we killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Awake, why sleepest thou, O Lord? Arise, cast us not off forever. Wherefore hidest thou thy face and forgettest our afflictions and our, and our oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our belly cleaveth unto the earth. Arise for our help and redeem us for thy mercy's sake. We've got one last move of God left. To raise up from the valley of dry bones. Ezekiel spoke about it. Can these dry bones live? The dry bones are here because of the spiritual drought. The animal or the, or the individual died and dried out from the drought. Ezekiel 
comes along and God says to Ezekiel, can these dry bones live? He says, oh Lord, thou knowest, I don't know. Speak to the bones. That's what we're doing right now. We're talking to you bones. You're listening by stick them. You're not a person. You're a bone. Just don't be bone headed. We're talking to the bones. He said speak to the bones. To do what? To amalgamate them. Bring them together as a unified force. Let me tell you something that a lot of folks are deceived by. They go home and I'm going to read my Bible by myself. I came out of that line, church. And I'm just going to stay home and I'm going to just trust the Lord myself. That ain't the body of Christ. The body of Christ is an amalgamated, joined together, fighting force. A voice must go forth to amalgamate the bones. Telling you, come and forge yourself together in, into an, a, an organism that's been fitly joined together as a force to contend with. That's why we say get behind us, financially support us. We want to move around to amalgamate the bones. It can't be about me on a Learjet because I ain't even going to be here. I can't speak this stuff out loud around the world and them not target me. That's why we raise up other folks. That's why you see other folks teaching these messages sitting in this chair and sitting here week after week. Because we know that other folks will have to step up to the plate. If Omar dies, then Tom will step up. If Tom is dead, then uh, Wesley will have to step up. Notice how they were killing the apostles and, the, and disciples left and right. The gospel never flinched one time and never went away. Somebody just dropped into the slot. Keep a rolling, buddy. As a matter of fact, the gospel prospers as the church is persecuted. You know why? Everybody was identified with the message personally. This is not Peter's message. This is not Paul's message. This is the message from God that came through Jesus Christ. And it's my message. I don't need Paul or Peter or James or John to prop me up. This is my deal this time. I'm not, I'm not somewhere sulking behind because Matt Ryan threw an interception. I got the ball. I'm throwing the passes. Success or failure is going to be contingent on my faithfulness this time. Did I pay the price? Did I fast and pray? Did I seek the Lord while he might be found? Did I work while, while it was day because the hour comes when no man can work? See, this is all systematically done. Folks must get, get practice to do things. So they speak, and they, when they put on out there on the front line and they got to fight, be second nature or first nature to them. You say the same thing to two people that you say to 2,000. It won't vary not one inch because it's what you are, it's not what you do. I don't spend time trying to think up stuff to say because it doesn't change. Oh, I got called to this church. They got 5,000 members. Let me go somewhere and fast and pray and study now and get into the word really and get a message. I wouldn't even have to take a Bible in there. Because it doesn't change for anybody. If it's what you are, you don't have to start going through gymnastics to get ready to do anything. I am that I am. Somebody on the internet would say, he said he was God. They'll just cut that clip out right there and say, see what he said? See that Pastor Price is a false prophet. He said before those people and said, I am that I am. What he was saying was that he was God and come to him. Uh-huh. Christianity is a state of being. You are the Christian. You are the temple of God. See, everything in the Bible never talks about doing and trying to be. And trying to look like organically grown out of you is the nature of Christ consuming you and it becomes what you are. And the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart the mouth will speak. I can only say what I am. That's what God is basing everything on. You can't say above what you are. Squeeze toothpaste. If it's crest, crest is coming out. Under pressure. The confession of a Christian can't change. Because this is all I am. This is all I know. I don't know anything else. You know, God's plan for you as a woman was to marry a man. And 
and join yourself to him as a virgin. That's this is the this is the plan of God from from conception. You should never have known a man until you got married to that one man as a virgin and join yourself to him. You know what will keep you? I don't know anybody else. That's right. You all I know. I don't know what it's like to have sex with nobody else. I don't know nobody else but you. I don't know how nobody else make me feel. I don't know. I don't know nobody else but you. Man, you'd be locked up. Everybody, every other guy would be sealed out from you. The only reason you imagine other folk with you is because you've had other folks. That's what's doing it. That's the stimuli the devil uses. That's what he, he, your, what you've done before. So he uses that as flashing lights to imagine other people. When you've known somebody, just one person though, there's no imagination to, to pull out of you because I don't know him, but nobody else. I got him, I'm with him, that's my husband, that's my man, I'm his woman, I'm signed, sealed, and delivered to him. Forget y'all. And that can happen to you as God cleanses your soul from the sin you were in. It'll happen the same way he'll reformat you, be faithfully attached to your husband or wife, Everything else will be cast to the outside and none of that stuff stimulates you. Everybody got a body. See, notice how carnal fleshly people who are in sin, their body is their calling card. They use their bodies like you use a knife or a rake or whatever. Well, best, the best thing I, I use them is a hoe. They use a hoe when you're digging in your yard, you know, using a hoe. They use your, their body like you use a hoe. They're out there and their body is their calling card. So these little hot mamas looking at you, what they're really saying to you is, look at, now look at this body. You're going to pass this up? And that's all they bring to the table. A body. You don't want to talk to them. You don't want, want to be conversating with them or trying to understand them because you can't even make out what they were talking about. You want a relationship with somebody that's got some sense. That's why you walk with the Lord. The devil is a discombobulated babbling brook of a moron. I want to talk to God. God's got stuff he knows. God is interesting. God is intellectual. God has all kinds of attributes and all kinds of idiosyncrasies that are really germane to your being enlightened and growing. The devil was just somewhere cursing, lying, stealing, talking crazy, doing something crazy, smoking some dope, drinking some liquor, watching some porno, trying to evaluate what Kim Kardashian said to her sister Chloe last week, trying to understand what what the lyrics of Kanye West's latest song was, trying to understand what Jay, Jay-Z meant in that last song he made last album, trying to... Look how much gibberish, garbage, and unfruitful foolishness the devil has folks wrapped up in. I want to know something that's going to improve my lot in life, move me on, going to make me better than I was yesterday. God is full of that. Let me just join myself to God and forget the rest of these spirits and the rest of this trash. A slaughterhouse that's going, just, just, just encapsulated in the abortion areas right now. They're slaughtering babies all day, every day. Worldwide, hundreds of thousands of babies slaughtered. Why? Jezebel rules. To honor Baal, you must offer sacrifices to, to Baal. Satan requires the sacrifices of the unborn children to sustain his power. An abortuary is not a clinic to get rid of an unwanted child. It's a temple of sacrifice to Satan so Satan's spirit stays empowered. The only way we can offset the sacrifice of these babies to Satan is to sacrifice up ourselves. Romans 12.1 I beseech thee therefore brethren that you present your body as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind to prove the good acceptable and perfect will of God. To offset the sacrifice of these babies, you and I must be sacrificed up to the living God so God's power can come down here through here to cut through the darkness that's come upon the earth because of the bloodbath of these babies being sacrificed to Satan. That's what's really going on. 
Satan requires sacrifice to empower himself. He can't get you to kill a human or kill yourself. So butcher the young innocents. The White House don't know nothing about this. What can they tell you about it? The doctor don't understand it. The lawyer don't understand it. The psychiatrist is dumb to it. Babbling brook moron preachers don't know what's going on. You better turn home toward the, home, the true and living God and get your mind totally clear and purged. October 31st is a high day for Satanists and witchcraft workers. The witches that got pregnant nine months ago are preparing to bring their babies out of the womb so they can butcher them and eat them October 31st. That's what the church world don't want to hear nothing about because they don't know nothing about it, don't care about it. Witches and warlocks get power from cannibalism. Drinking the fluids from a human. That's what oral sex is all about. It's ingesting the bodily fluids of a human for witchcraft working power. Male semen is ingested for witchcraft working power because blood is in the semen. Go out to the new birth and ask Eddie Long why how he got power and mind control over those folk. You ingesting the semen of a young boy. Especially a young virgin boy. You actually raise them and breed them like cattle on a farm for you to drink their semen. Making sure they never have touched a woman. Which is raised boys for this. And they try to tell you about pedophilia. Word pedo comes from a Greek word which means child. Look. You see words in the Bible like a catamite, the Bible translates it effeminate. A catamite was a young boy raised by a Roman or a Greek citizen to actually have, a, have, have he raised him as a, as a cup bearer, as a young boy, bred him to be a sodomite boy for him to use. A virgin boy he raised from a boy, a young child. Just like Ed alone did it. He effeminized the boy, turned the boy into a woman. And the boy was used to curling up under him every night and sleeping like a woman up under him. And being sodomized by this guy. Gutting him of all his masculinity. Your mama was a Jezebel spirit, she gutted you. And raised you as a girl. You're a man walking around with a, uh, with a dress, high heel slippers. And curls draped down your back on the inside. And now it's bleeding over to the outside as you paint your nails and, and, and grow your hair down your back in dreadlocks. And put your two earrings on. See, it's bleeding outside now. What, what was put in on the inside. In a matronized home where your mama raised you. It's especially germane to young black boys. Who have no ability to be a man whatsoever because they were raised by a matron. Effeminized by their mama. And this gospel won't appeal to you. See, when you're a feminine, when you're a girl inside, that's when I become a sorcerer. Because you're a gal that don't want to submit to a manly, authoritative, masculine presentation of God. And you don't want a man up. You want to escape to listen to some old hip-hop trash and call it gospel hip-hop. Gospel rappers. It's garbage. You just steal a gal inside. We're living in a slaughterhouse. We should have a stadium full of guys that are irate about babies being butchered like this. Mad and angry that the devil's killing all these children and want to rise up to stand against this spiritual force. I make no apologies. Call me Creflo. Creflo, give me a dollar if you want to. You need to support this, finance this, stand with this. It's incumbent upon the body of Christ to, to, to support and finance the message of God. If you identify as the message of God, it's your responsibility to get in and go with it. Right. If you're responsible for what you know. You're not responsible for what you don't know. I'm not planning on longevity. I'll be 55 years old in November, so I could care less about living a long time. I've lived two-thirds of my life any way you cut it. 
I got to get a job done. I got to tell it like I got to tell it and get out of here. You should feel the same way. They're doing what they planned all along as the Illuminist. They are raising up a one world government they call the New World Order. People are jockeying for positions in the New World Order. That's what this is all about. Everything you see in front of you politically is about folks jockeying for position before the world rulers to see who they will allow and appoint to get in realms of rulerships. That's why they appoint ambassadors and appoint secretary of the treasurer. And appoint, they are trying to jockey for positions because they know the world dynamics are changing. And I want to have a high chair in this. And I want to be in a place of authority when they change it. So I'm trying to show the world controllers and rulers I can be trusted and I am faithful. I will do whatever you say. If you tell me to shut up in the debate and let Mitt Romney win, I'll do it. And that's what the man did. Because they told him to do it. You don't change character in front of people on a whole home. If you see a dynamic change of character in front of you, they are under command to change what they're doing. John McCain, shut your mouth and let Obama win. Hillary, back off. And we'll appoint you as Secretary of State because you obeyed us. If you think this is helter skelter and this is done, you know, on, on, off the cuff, you are deceived. They sit with slide rulers on Park Avenue in penthouses, Harvard graduates, Yale graduates, Princeton graduates, MIT graduates, and plan out with a slide rule everything they do. You think slavery is gone? No, sir. You better think again. We got to have folk to do these menial tasks we need done. Make furniture, press license plates, pick up paper on the street. We'll loose gangster rap, thug rap. We'll criminalize these folks' minds by letting crack into the neighborhoods and drugs. And knowing that these young boys will fall prey to criminal activity and get these 10 and 15 and 25 year jail sentences. Privatize the, the prison system. Well, people make money off of it. You sell the stocks in the prison systems. The government supplements the prison systems based on how many people you have in prison. It's a money making deal. They are the modern day slaves. They hire on Jay-Z, Snoop Dogg, T-Pain, Rick Ross, Lil Wayne, Lil Romeo to criminalize the society. To make these boys thinking being a thug with a, with a third grade education is glamorous. To make the girls in the 10 cent holes dropping babies one after another. To have a steady supply of thug life boys to put in prison. That's why they want them breeding having seven and eight babies in the ghetto. So you always got a steady supply of slaves in the prison system. You hire, you hire these 10 cent dogs to, to bring forth that stinking rap music. Had to be financed by big money boys. Where Jay Z getting money from to finance an operation like this? The world rulers give it to him. And make him a mason and flash up that triangle in front of you letting you know I have allegiance to the world rulers that financed me and made me. I'm their errand boy. I'm making you into a brain dead moron because they need prisoners in the prison system in order to carry out their dastardly deeds by enslaving you to do these meaningless, meaning, meaningless tasks that nobody else wants to do or can do. And we got a free workforce. Buddy, you on a plantation with your hand, your pants pulled down to your butthole with dreadlocks down your back wearing two earrings tattooed from... From, from head to toe, like an organ grinder's monkey, cause the boys with the slide rules from Yale and Harvard designed it that way. And you'll think we're playing with a chump with the devil. The devil don't do nothing unorganized. He thinks it all out. 
I need these folk to do my bidding because I need this, my operation to sustain. The whole world lies in the wicked one. It bleeding over to white society too. The same young white boys going to prison the same way. You better get rid of racial distinctions. It's the haves and the have-nots. We live in a system of feudalism. Feudal lords enslave the serfs on their big feudal plantations. Medieval times, the feudal lords were the landowners. And they subjugated everybody to themselves as slaves called serfs. Sharecroppers that lived off the, off the feudal lords. You know what the knights were? The knights were the protectors of the feudal lords. They were hired henchmen. That's what the police are. The army is. The military force is. They protect the rich man and his investments. If the rich man's investments are getting troubled in Libya, you send the knights to go and protect his investments. Or you send them to Iran or Iraq or Afghanistan. Wherever the rich man is threatened by some uprising of the serfs. Y'all better wake, wake up and smell the coffee because it's brewing. Been brainwashed so badly that you answer not a word because you're scared of them. You make the true and living God small. And these jokers that serve the devil so large, they're larger than life, larger than life. They're giants in the land. How can God stand against this devil's massive army? These are just men, pawns in the hands of the devil. Man, get with God. Sell the farm. Sell out. If they kill you, they're doing you a favor. Certain death, sudden glory. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. This can't be just talk though. It has to happen to you. You got to see the sinister hopelessness that's down here. That's going nowhere. We're trying to get happy, be happy. Have a nuclear family and be Ozzy and Harriet and, and never, never land. Look, man, this is a war between two spiritual entities that is not letting up. It's a slaughterhouse from the front door to the back door. It was a slaughterhouse when, you, when the doctor spanked your butt and you began to cry. It'll be a slaughterhouse when they stand over you over a grave and say, your, say the last rites over your body. You came into a slaughterhouse. And you left one. It ain't going to change. You check history. History is full of one thing. Bloodletting. Check it out. From day one to now. Blood has been flowing like a river. In a slaughterhouse. Turn to the true and living God. If you listen to this and you're not saved. I offer no false hope for you. You better get saved. Get in that Bible. Get to know the Lord. And get yourself free. Because all you got down here to look forward to is imminent destruction. Last thing I'll say to wrap it up. Halloween is the devil's high day. He, oper he operates in solstices and lunar cycles. It's moving from summer into the fall. It's a high day. When they make their sacrifices, they seek out the devil in fasting and prayer. They get before him sky clad and have orgies to celebrate Satan's enthronement. Sometimes he'll come there, they'll prepare a throne for Satan. He'll come and sit over the orgy and be a moderator of the naked bodies all bathed in filth and, and, and nastiness in front of him. Drinking urine and eating the feces. Butchering the babies and drinking the blood. Butchering animals and drinking the blood rather than animal hot. And Satan will sit there in throne to be worshipped by debauchery and filth. Like they have down in New Orleans during southern decadence on Labor Day. That's just a high festival of Satan. To be entertained by the debauchery of thousands of men coming into town to sodomize each other and drink semen 
and perform oral anal sex on each other. And the devil sits enthroned over the masses, groveling at his feet in filth and perversion and decadence. October 24th through the 31st, we always encounter these devils. Meet them at the gate, seven days of fasting and prayer. So 24th through the 31st, like we always do a week out from Halloween into Halloween, we challenge these devils and these witchcraft workers and sorcerers on a global scale. Nobody's backing up from the devil. He'll hit you with all kinds of stuff. He'll give you body aches and pains. He'll try to bring sickness, disease, infirmity, headaches. He'll make you a, your life a living hell if he can. So what? We're focused on another place other than here. And we keep pounding the devil right on anyway. No matter what he does, in spite of what he does. <laughs> Excuse me, we can... <laughs> we confront this devil at the gate because he's always afoot seeking to kill you yes, the devil's trying to kill you 24 hours a day 7 days a week mm -hmm. every day when you wake up and hit the ground running the devil's got a plan to kill you that day and only God can abort that mission and make it not successful this is a place of murder Iniquity and total depravity. And we better address it as such. And be, be ready to stand in all still times. The Bible says, having done all to stand, stand therefore. Your loins girt about with truth. Helmet of salvation, that helmet of hope clamped on your head. Feet are covered and shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You have on a breastplate. Breastplate of righteousness. I will not bow to evil. I'm not going to become an adulterer. Yes. I'm not bowing the knee to any temptation. Yeah, yeah. Righteousness covers my chest. Yeah. I have on a breastplate of righteousness. In one hand I've got a shield. Called faith. What I believe will quench the fiery darts aimed at me by the devil. And then my counterattack is to come with the sword of the spirit. And it is is written that's how you got to go out of here I refuse to bow I'm an armor clad warrior living in a slaughterhouse we're living in Auschwitz Bougainville and Treblinka we're in a Hitler death camp every day 7 o'clock in the morning the vacuum extraction hoses kick in the saline solution is poured over the head of a baby and burning his eyeballs out of the sockets. And no one cares. I'm not going out of here like this. I'm standing up with everything I've got for what is right on the side of God. If you can walk around and ride around in this with all those babies yelling. They had a movie one time they made called A Silent Scream. In the womb, in the confines of his own mama, burned to death. Eyebrows burned off. Hands burned off. Throat scorched by sailing solution. Burning the baby's guts out of him. And we walk around happy, concerned about the falcons and the braves and the Steelers and the and the Oilers and well they the Texans now and all these folks, the Titans and all these different names given to these sports arenas. The Bible told us that they worship creeping things and animals and things of that nature. That's exactly what we do. Right now we call them mascots. The war eagle down in Auburn. Ugga the dog down in Georgia. Mascots are nothing but the creeping things and the feline things and the animalistic things that the humans worship. Sports teams have become the modern day idols. And these babies are being burned and hacked to death every day. I hope I make people feel about it. I hope the people that have been involved in abortion feel something about it. Because maybe that will give folks the intestinal fortitude to stand up and do something on the side of righteousness. When self was at the center of your life, 
you kill your own offspring for the sake of self you like to me you would stand up for God to avenge what you did in your own ignorance inspired by the devil I'll be something that you know what I was led by the devil to kill my own offspring I'm going to stand up with everything I've got with all my energy all my fervor all my fury everything in me against the same fallen cherubim that led me to murder and I'm coming against them with a vengeance that should be the natural response to what I'm saying right now let's pray Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus God, hopefully in the name of Jesus, inspiration began to be given to people to wake up out of this coma and stop being halt between two opinions. Elijah says, God of Baal, and they answered him not a word. Standing and looking and hiding behind a bunch of junk on Facebook and Twitter and MySpace and all this escape to social mediums so as not to actually be responsible. We're not preaching the same thing and we don't make any apology for it. This is not the same message and we're not coming in the same spirit and we're not going to act like we are. This is evil at its highest level. From the White House to the outhouse. In Europe, in Asia, Australia, and every continent on this, on this planet. Evil lurks. With that cosmic creator, Satan, ruling over this whole domain at the top of the pyramid. God, in the name of Jesus, as we go into a committed, concerted effort of prayer and fast. And we pray every night right now at 9 o'clock. As we ramp it up to high levels of prayer. High levels of praise. Grinding ourselves down in fasting till there's nothing left of human personality. Come forth from the bowels of a crucified, sacrificed life, according to Romans 12 1, and live. Let Christ live at our expense. You said if we lose our lives, we would find life. If we hold on to this stinking filthy life here, we'll lose our lives. God, these are serious times for serious people. This is not for the faint of heart. This is not for that same old religious mess that's going on. Indoctrinated folks that sit there stymied and, and answer Elijah not a word. We're looking for people that commit. On a global scale, if you hear me, commit. Help finance this thing. We're right now in the middle of writing the next book we have put out, put forth, the organic gospel. To teach these folks that this thing is organically grown. God sent forth laborers to assist everything that's done down here. Not just here, but wherever a man or woman of God has set up to actually represent the truth, give support to those people. That the gospel is not stymied because people are just plain old cotton picking scared of the devil. And by being afraid of him, I'm destined to spend eternity with him in hell. My own fear will assure the fact that I'll be with him forever. I can't afford to be afraid. Stand and stand therefore is what you told me to do. And after, after having done all to stand, stand in Jesus' name. God, loose us from these delusions. Loose us from the power of witchcraft and sorcery. Loose us to serve the true and living God. A slaughterhouse. We're living in it, bathing in it, eating in it, walking around and driving in it, talking in it. Every day, thousands butchered. Or Hitler death camp. And the politicians stand there behind the microphone, smiling in our faces. Talking about everything's alright. Recovery is at hand. Have your best life now, says the false prophet Joel Osteen. Mr. Perfect with that false stinking smile on his face. 
damning thousands to hell in the lake of fire. As a nice curly headed little boy like Opie Taylor who wouldn't love him. The devil at his best. God wake up, shake up this sleeping giant. Raise it up. We prophesy to the bones. Then we prophesy to the wind. Fill the loins of the church with the Holy Ghost. Amalgamate us. Bring us together as a fighting force. God, let us go out of here hot representing Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. One thing I'll say to you, no matter how this ends, no matter what happens to you, no matter if you die in this, if they strap me into the electric chair, if they, if they drop the cyanide in the pool to let the cyanide fumes kill me, if the guillotine is coming down on my head, let my last words be these. I curse and damn thee, Satan, to a lake of fire forever. You, your fallen angels and your demons and every human that follows you. I leave this earth with a curse on my lips for the cherub angel that would dare stand against the army of the living God. I damn you. I curse you in Jesus name. We'll see y'all back here next week. Have a good week. Keep in prayer. Stay before the true and living God and not the idols.